the country's best. So that's pretty cool. And visitors can tour the facilities at both their locations in Comstock and Kalamazoo. And uh, they can learn all about the process of brewing, fermentation, packaging, things like that. Good for them. It's Heather with the news. Coming up next, blame game, seven in a row. Red Wings getting booed off the ice last night. It's 97-1. Hey, it's going to be warm. It's going to rain. It's going to be warm. It's going to rain. And all of that is going to cause your lawn to green up, start growing. And if you want to have the best lawn, give Natural Way Lawn and Tree Service a call. Get green, stay green with Natural Way. That number, 888-GET-GREEN. Right now, for a limited time, you can purchase a full lawn program. You're going to get free grub control, but you got to mention my name along with the station. And you get green, you stay green, you save some green when you prepay. Call by the end of the month for the early bird discount. You're going to get fewer chemicals and environmentally sound practices. That's the natural way difference. They're going to assign your lawn its own specialist, and they're going to send out certified applicators at Arborist to, to take care of the custom tailor solutions that they've designed for your yard and your home. It's a locally owned company. We love to leave our, our we love to keep our money local. They've been locally owned for over three decades. They're going to give you 100% satisfaction guaranteed. So give them a call, 888 Get Green, or on the web at naturalwaylawn.com. Natural Way Lawn and Tree Service. Get green, stay green with Natural Way.
kind of a soft goal. Red Wings would lose 4-1. Booed off the ice at home. Seven straight losses, John. Ouch. Oh, who do you blame? Let's play the blame game. Seven in a row. I, I know the easy answer is the patch or my car flags or Rieger's bald head. And he even tried putting a patch on his bald head. You know, the whole like... There's only so much you can do. Uh, I, I know. We just need to acknowledge it's it's not some jinx. It's not something woven on a sweater. They're not as good as we thought they were. That's the painful reality, but it's the reality. I blame the players. I blame the coach. I don't blame a patch. I, and I'm more of the mindset of blaming the players, specifically the veterans that were brought in in this for this scenario. And whether or not you were brought in because you thought maybe Dylan Larkin would be out, nobody's going to predict an injury, but for those that were brought in for this time of year, for a playoff run, for the experience of of being a, somebody that has been in a can we can we fight to stay in the wild card? Can we fight to win a a, a Stanley Cup playoff series? Like Dylan uh, Dylan Larkin is out, mm-hmm. and he and, and I think it's being highlighted how much he does for this team, but. Where is Patrick Kane? What 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 are the numbers that he? Had? What's the production, Jim, that he's had since this streak has started? Yeah, I went back seven games. We're texting during the game, and we're spitballing. Okay, well, go back, dig it up, see what these guys have been doing. Patrick Kane is a minus six in the seven games. He had an assist last night. One goal, two assists in the seven games. It's not good enough. Alex DeBrinket, no goals in the seven games. One assist. He's a minus seven. Throw in Lucas Raymond, who I think has, has showed some fight and feistiness, but two goals, one assist, a minus 13 in the seven-game losing stretch. Their best players aren't leading the way. And the veterans, they throw Comfort in there too. Guys who have been part of like deep playoff runs aren't stepping up. That's Those, those are the guys that you should be counting on. This is the third year for Lucas Raymond. The biggest moves Iserman made in the offseason were to trade a first-round pick for Alex Dabrinkit. And, and to find Patrick Kane a home here in Detroit. Those are the biggest headline moves they made. Those are the moves that are supposed to help you when you lose your captain. You're not going to win every game, but you can't lose every game. John, 12 goals in the seven games. What was a great offense it vanished. So along those lines, what was the one thing throughout the course of this season that we kept hanging our hat on. The one thing, even though even at the beginning of the year, had defense wasn't playing well, and all of a sudden you had a goalie lion step up, and now he's not playing. But what's the one thing that you would look back seven seven games ago and say, I believe we can continue to count on this aspect? We, we said it on this show. The idea was you could roll three or four lines and score the offense. They had been one of the best offenses in all of hockey, and that's gone. The depth, the depth of the goal scorers. And you've got 13 guys that have scored double digits. And it was the fact that you never knew night in, night out where it was going to come from. Now you thought, well, hey, Dylan Larkin, he'd be a part of that answer uh, on a given night. Alex DeBrinkett, Patrick Kane, and now obviously all of those three have, have, Dylan Larkin has disappeared due to injury, but the others have disappeared completely and they're still on the ice. So what do you guys blame? You blame the patch, you blame Rieger, you blame car flags, you blame the stars, the, the you blame the coach. I mean, Lalone, we talked about it. He called the the Buffalo game not a must win, but a must play well. They gave up four opening period goals. Then he started to tinker with the lines, trying to shake things up. Again, they didn't respond. They gave up a shorthanded goal in the first period. John, like how much blame does does he get in all this? Like, we've seen teams fire their coach and try to salvage their season. This is only the second year. I don't think anybody was prepared to have this conversation two weeks ago. No. But th- there is a question as to, like, are they tuning him out? And we asked yesterday, the question was, you know, what was that fight uh, at practice? Was that a team full of frustration? Was that a locker room blowing up? I don't think so. And we saw both of those guys have each other's back yesterday with about five minutes left, well, two minutes left in the second period All of a sudden, hey, you saw some of that fight. You saw each of them have each other's back, and then all of a sudden they're a man down in the last two minutes, and and Mo Sider comes in and blasts somebody against the boards. You're like, okay, here we go. This is the spark. Yeah, and and even though they didn't end up doing anything at the end of the second, you thought, let's start the third with this type of intensity, and then it was 
flat line. It was nothing. They kill off the penalty at the end of the second. And you're right. Siders you know, throwing the body around. You think, okay, this the first two, three, four minutes of the third period will be pretty telling. Still a one-goal game at the time. And you come out and play like the better team. You are the better team. You can win this game. And instead, they lose four to one, and and it's it's to the point where sure, fight is better than no fight. But at the end of the day, if you lose, if the streak doesn't get snapped, if you just keep losing hockey games, at some point, someone's got to be responsible for this. This can't be the second year in a row where they bow out, especially not after they made the moves this off season. They they brought adults into the room to avoid this. But and for this exact time, that's why I say it's this time of year where you're bringing in veteran leadership, vet, veteran experience. So that when you are in a playoff chase and you're an organization, not just this year's team, but an organization trying to get over the hump, get into the playoffs. And you're finally there. You're you're eight up at one point, nine up at one point. And then it's six up. You know, like, okay, well, somebody's going to step up. Mm -hmm. Dylan Larkin goes down. Then you're four up. Then you're two up. Then you're tied. Then you're just below the cut line. You're back above the cut line, below the cut line. And then the night when the Islanders lose and you have a chance to make up a couple of points, they drop and, and lay an egg, and you do as well. People are fed up. They got booed off the ice last night. People are fed up. To what do you put most of that anger and frustration? Ticket Texter says, it sounds like you guys are trying to shield Iserman from any blame in all of this. I'd be happy to address that. If they miss the playoffs, the Iser plan is off course. There won't be shielding Steve Iserman from this. People go, well... You know, you say five years, but the first couple he had to clean out some bad deals. I know that's why we talk about five years. He has since cleaned out all of Ken Holland's bad contracts. He has signed his own guys. He's drafted his own guys. Some of his players are skating at the NHL level, and he claims he has guys ready in Grand Rapids. That's why he didn't feel like he needed to add any any more pieces at the deadline. If they miss the playoffs, he will also be on this, this, uh, this, he'll have a slice of blame pie. There's going to be plenty of of blame to go around. You can blame the Blair, blame the, the players because they're the ones that are most visible and we're watching and, and they've, they, they have come up woefully short in this stretch. You could blame the loan and the mix up in the lines. It, it has clearly messed with the chemistry, but you're not getting Dylan Larkin back today. So how does he find a way to recreate that chemistry that's on him? And then obviously everybody that's on the ice, everybody that's, that's on the bench, Steve Iserman has handpicked all of those guys. I guess the blame for me, I think I would put guys like Kane and DeBrinkett and and Raymond and Comfer, the guys who are their best forwards in the top six on the top two lines. The fact that the offense has disappeared, those guys are supposed to be the ones that step up in this moment. So I would give them probably the biggest slice of blame. Second, it would be Lalone, and then probably Iserman. Two four eight five three nine ninety seven ninety seven. Let's get Kevin in Burton involved. Kevin, you're on ninety seven one. It's got to be Steve Eiserman. Okay, why? Why? And 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 here's why. If you look at if you look at how how people in our Detroit teams uh, succeed, it's always because the general managers brought in that big splash when they supposed to. Rodriguez back when uh, Detroit started. Rodriguez was an example to come here, uh, Pudge, uh, mm-hmm. for baseball yep. back in the day. People follow. Um, uh, the Pistons, uh, the go-to-work Pistons, they were bringing in people like, uh, well, I mean, yeah, they, people go to work, but they brought in Rashid, and, and that put them over the top. Uh, currently right now with the Lions, they're playing a lot better because the, the guys up top are putting pieces in place. Um, and this, this is two years in a row that we were on the, the fringe of uh, making the playoffs and didn't make move, and we fought for that short right after the no move. I just think that the, they feed off of what management does, and if management don't show confidence in you, how can you have confidence in yourself? So are you talking about the deadline, the fact that they didn't add? The you dead, thought, yeah, the, they, they didn't show confidence in this group. That's your... The, the Read deadline out. and yeah. and and with the, and with the lions it wasn't about let you know it wasn't about we're um we're not there we're we're there with the lions we just wait wait for the season to get done nobody said we weren't there we've been showing that we're not ready in Detroit and we are ready we just got to make the playoffs you got to take them and it's been five years 
uh, we're ready. You got to make the move to put us over the top. Kevin, um, whether it's round one, round two, or a championship, hockey, you can win the championship. We already, it's already been proven. Last, but if you don't make the moves, you're not going to get there. Yeah. Uh, we, we saw upsets even as recent as last year in the NHL playoffs. The Seattle Kraken are the comp I've used. They're not a great team last year. They had a bunch of scorers, uh, depth scoring, and they upset the Colorado Avalanche in the first round last year. You get in, you find a way. Florida last year was a unique situation. They won the President's Trophy the year before and then just kind of eked in as an eight seed. But they made it all the way to the Stanley Cup. I don't think Detroit's a cup contender, and I, I understand why Iserman didn't feel like he needed to make a big swing at the deadline. But he also said he felt like they had the depth here to call up if they hit a rough patch. That was his point. I don't need to go add a guy. I've got I've got guys in Grand Rapids. So the question will be, and I know Evanson got injured recently, but you can't let this roster just sit as is losing in perpetuity. Like, is someone getting waived? Is someone getting called up? Is there, is there something that they could do to shake this up? We want to hear from you guys. And I, I see we got people on hold. We'll keep talking a little Red Wing hockey. We get to the Lions in the 9 o'clock hour. It's 97-1. Hey, FanDuel's putting the ball in your court for the rest of the NBA season because right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's new customers getting 200 bucks back if your bet just simply wins. Bet on the NBA with a wide range of betting types, including quick bets, live same game parlays, player props, whatever you think is going to hit. You put that 5 bucks down and you're going to get your 200 bucks back. So visit FanDuel.com slash Jansen to make your first bet a layup. Uh, did I say five bucks? It's ten bucks. Uh, you got to be able to put down FanDuel, official sports book partner of the NBA and 97 won the ticket. Must be 21 or over in present Michigan. First online real money wager, $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued is now a drawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problems. Call 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help.
Shorthanded goal. Can't happen. 4-1 loss to the Coyotes. Can't happen. Seven straight losses when you previously have a playoff spot secured. John, can't happen. And people were booing them as they left the ice last night. So we asked this morning, who are you directing those boos towards? Is that a, an individual player, the players, the coach, Iserman, the patch? I saw a video that was circulating on social media, people chanting about the patch. I think the patch is the low-hanging fruit. It's the easy target. It's seven in a row. At some point, that's something deeper than a patch. That's your hockey team. I put it on to Brinkett and Kane. I know you have said the same thing as a guy who played. Yep. Like It's on the players at the end of the day to snap out of this. Your best players score some freaking goals so that you're not down and you're not playing from behind and you're not gripping the stick. And that, that becomes contagious when everybody starts to press. Patrick Kane's won three Stanley Cups. What are you, minus six on the seven games here? Had an assist last night, but very, very rare that he is producing points during this stretch. you got to have individuals that are ready, willing, and able to step up when somebody else goes down. Now, do you look at this and say, is there something that Derek Lalone should have been doing to prepare for the possibilities of Dylan Larkin going down? Or if it was Debrinkit, or if it was Kane, insert any player that is, we thought, key to the success, should you have been doing something along the way to prepare for that moment? That's that's on the loan. And I don't know the answer to that question. Some of it would be Jeff Petrie's minutes. Why is this guy playing on the top two pairs? Some of it might be Alex Lyon. You've really asked him to do a lot. Are you starting to see some wear? They're giving up four goals every single game. Um yeah, and I think just the overall, are they tuning you out when you emphasize these games and you're not close? He's he's fair game. 248-539-9797. We're going to talk Lions in the 9 o'clock hour. DJ Reader, does it change the way you view Holmes and this offseason? Let's get to Cameron in a car. Cameron, good morning. Hey, happy Friday, gentlemen. You too. Yeah, happy Friday. Hey, so I, I couldn't agree more with you guys. Um, you know, Steve Eisenman went out and he brought in some adults with Stanley Cup pedigree. And you, they have to be held accountable. I mean, we're a week removed from Patrick Kane saying that this team could play and beat anybody in the seven-game series. This team's so long ago. I'm not sure they can beat. I don't know if they win another game in the next week while Dylan Larkin's out. Yeah, because you'd think, well, the Coyotes are bad and you get them at home. Nope, 4-1 loss. Who, who can you even circle on the schedule and say that's a win? The answer is nobody right now, not with the way they're playing. Well, even, even the teams that are, you know, behind them in the points, I mean, the Sabres are looking great. Yeah. And, you know, we're playing them tomorrow in the, in, in the afternoon. I honestly think it's time for Steve Eisenman to go down and just cherry pick Grand Rapids. I think it's uh, time for Sebastian Costa to come up, see what he's got. I'm always leery with a young goalie's development, but maybe it's a Marco Casper or or maybe it's – they've already called up Berggren and, and they got to get Edvinson healthy, but I'd love Edvinson to be called up. Cameron, you're right, man. I mean, they can't just let this fester. And, and you mentioned they're playing the Sabres this weekend. Do you want to go to the game? I'm all down. I mean, I uh, – to be honest with you, it's hard for me to watch. I turned the game off last night after it was 2 nothing, but – I mean, I'm I'm a Red Wings fan through and through, and it's, you know, I went from the highest of the highs thinking, you know, playoff drought's over, we're going, let's put the flags on the car, to I don't even want to see this team play in the playoffs. For what, to get spanked, swept by the Panthers in four games? You're a Red Wing fan. You go through the emotions of this hockey team. Uh, yeah, we do have that pair, so why don't th- we'll put we'll put Cameron on hold. We'll give him that pair. If you want it, if you want tickets, DetroitRedWings.com. He's going to go to the Buffalo Sabres game on March 16th at Little Caesars Arena. John, do you want him to chant Jared Goff? Is that part of the problem here? Uh, I don't care what they do um, because it, you and I both know the whole Jared Goff chants, the patch, Rieger's head, <laughs> like none of this is impacting what's going on on the ice. I just simply want them to go out there and play a complete game. It feels like, and we talked about it last night when we were texting back and forth, and we were a little bit excited even though they were down 2-1 going into the the, the, the second intermission. And <clears throat> you're looking at it going, it feels like they're playing three separate games every time they play a game. Each period kind of has its own character, 
and whatever was whatever emotion, whatever sense of urgency you kind of felt was emanating from the team at the end of the second period evaporated before they came out in the third period. One of the texts you sent me, I'm looking at it right now. What's your confidence level the Wings can recover tonight? This was sent when it was a 2-1 hockey game. Mm-hmm. And I said, the Wings have looked like the better team. They've had four power plays. If we didn't have the weight of all this losing, I tell you, 6 out of 10, they're going to dig out of a deficit, they're going to win the game. But with this hanging over their head, yeah. the fact they can't beat anybody, I was like, I don't know, like 3 out of 10? You said, yeah, I'm closer to a 1. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just... that's kind of what you're feeling. Now I know at some point they are going to win another game. Promise? I don't think they... <laughs> you promise, John? I, I promise. I can promise that. They're going to win another game. The question is going to be, is it going to be too little, too late? Are they able to get on another hot streak? Are they able to get back to at least, you know, the the, the 50-50, maybe a point a game where they were? Or, you know, just above a point a game. Like that's, and we thought that's all they had to do to get that final playoff spot a couple of weeks ago, and now we're looking at it going, well, now you're going to have to get a point and a half. Maybe you're going to need two points. Like it, it, your opportunities are are dwindling. Well, that got you because you were doing a little scoreboard watching too. You were watching oh, the, yeah, Islanders, the Islanders. Oh, yeah, the Islanders. I'm like, hey, the Islanders are down 3 nothing. Let's on, go. And then on. the fight happened. I sent that text when the fight happened, and I, and I instantly was like, all right, here we go. And then that's why I said when they, when they came out in the third period, it was just like, wah, wah, wah. Ticket Texter says, no great goalie. We don't have Datsuk, Zetterberg, Lidstrom, or Chelios. No Scotty Bowman. They overachieved when the Lions were popping off. They were never that good from a Ticket Texter. Says, another one. Got to mention the defense and the turnovers. The third goal. Turnover in the O-zone. Four guys down low. Defense leaves guys open. Uncontested to the net. When your goalie's starting to shake, play a little shaky, you certainly can't give up odd man rushes, and you can't let the other team possess the puck. Everything that could go wrong has gone wrong for the Red Wings. Uh, Ticket Texter says, last year's collapse was strike one. This year's collapse is strike two. If we fail to make the playoffs, strike three, Lalone fired. Mm. It's, it's a, it's a, mm. I guess with the pitch clock, it goes quick now these days, huh? <laughs> it, uh, especially with your pitch clock. <laughs> Texter says, I don't get why people think Patrick Kane wasn't a big move. Iserman has made big moves. It wasn't at the deadline, but that's arguably the biggest move for any team this season. Eisman takes the blame after the year if they make if they miss the playoffs, but he made moves a GM should make during the season. The rest is on the players and coaches. Yeah, and this is we talk about the you know obviously the point total that you're going to need 92, 93 somewhere in there. It, it, it's what it feels like. And if Patrick Kane is that guy that's going to be able to get you that couple extra points to get you over the hump, this was the time to provide those extra points in this six, seven game stretch where even if you just win one of those games, you're still above the cut line. I know. I agree with that ticket texture wholeheartedly. We'll keep talking wings. I said we get into some Lions in the nine o'clock hour. DJ Reader, a big signing for the Detroit Lions. Does it change the way you view Holmes offseason? And coming up next, I have a statement I'd like to make, an apology to Lions Twitter. Okay. We'll get that right after the update. 97-1. Brought to you by 24 Seconds Bar and Grill. Michigan State is all but officially in, in the NCAA tournament for the 26th consecutive time. Spartans took care of Minnesota in the Big Ten tourney yesterday, 77-67, to earning a noon Friday date with Purdue. State played the Boilermakers tough two weeks ago in an 80-74 to loss in West Lafayette. Will the end result be any different today? Tom Izzo. MSU is a seven and a half point underdog, but is four and one all time against Purdue in the Big Ten tournament. Boilers, though, have won eight of the last nine meetings overall. Red Wings dropped their seventh in a row last night, losing four to one to the Coyotes. It's the longest winless drought for the Wings since 2019. The Pistons, believe it or not, with a chance to win three in a row for the first time in more than two years. They host Miami tonight here at here on 97.1 coverage starting at 635. 
And more than a dozen college athletes are suing the NCAA over its transgender policies, claiming its decision to allow transgender woman Leah Thomas to compete in the 2022 Women's Swimming National Championships violated their Title IX rights. Thomas won the national title that year in the women's 500-yard freestyle. At the Core Well Health Update Desk, I'm B.D. Howell. For more, go to 971 The Ticket or Odyssey.com. John, somewhat redundant that they were an elite run defense. That that's that's too harsh for Lions fans. I like the move, but I think we've reached this stage now with some Lions fans, and this this ties into the Holmes conversation we need to have, where if you aren't one hundred percent effusive in praise, you don't get it. You don't know ball. You don't understand. I really like the reader move. Was was I too negative? Um. No, uh, sometimes it's it's not necessarily what you say, it's how you say it. Okay. And and reading into it. And then your, you know, your quote tweet yourself, great move by the way. <laughs> and it says you guys are impossible, but then you shout at everyone. Oh no. I like the move. This is a positive tweet. Um the all cap shouting is is I could I could feel your tone. <laughs> but it, it it is redundant, but it's not. In it's reg- not a bad thing, though. It, but but here's the thing: last year, yes, they were a good run defense, but they had to do it by committee. Now, just because you signed DJ Reader doesn't mean that other guys don't play. They're just going to play less. Last year, it was Bugs, and then it was you know uh, uh, Benito Jones and and a cast of characters in there. Other than Aline McNeil, he was the one constant. Now, hopefully, you have a piece that is a much more constant factor in stopping the run. But here's the other thing. In doing so, you also have a player out there because his pass rush grade is relatively good. It's above average. So he's a guy that can push the depth of the pocket. Your your guards and centers are going to protect the depth of the pocket, which is where DJ Reader is going to play. And then, obviously, your tackles... They're, they're in charge of the width of the pocket, mm-hmm. and that's up to Aiden Hutchinson and whoever they're going to put opposite him, and you know, passing down is James Houston, to be able to narrow that. So you want to collapse that pocket from all levels. DJ Reader, obviously, is going to be a guy when you're facing the teams that you, you have to beat in division, because what did we see? 
Josh Jacobs, yep. and DeAndre Swift have been added to the run games in this division. Um, and then you look, and, and, and even Minnesota improved their run game, getting rid of Madison and then in, in, in adding Aaron Jones. Mm-hmm. Like They have improved their rushing attack outside the division, but still in the NFC to get to the, the Super Bowl. It's Christian McCaffrey. It's Saquon Barkley. The teams that you're going to face that have really good rushing attacks, but they also pair it with a good quarterback and a mobile quarterback. You want to eliminate some of the escape routes for the quarterback. And I think DJ Reader does both of those things. Yeah, he makes sense. I mean, I, I I said it. He Even yesterday on the show, I said it. He makes sense because he will make McNeil better. Head up over a guard is going to make Mc, McNeil look even better. It's going to help Aiden Hutchinson. You're going to be able to play five defensive backs and not get punished on the ground because you've got McNeil and Reader in the middle. And I do think it's one of the best one-two punches in the NFL. It may be the best one-two punch up the middle. PFF would agree based on last year's grades yeah. that those two in the middle are a force. They were already one of, if not the best run-stopping team in the NFL. But it doesn't mean it's a bad thing because stopping the run is going to be critically important. It's not just the division teams, to your point. It's also Christian McCaffrey and Saquon Barkley, the, the big dogs in the NFC that you are fighting for pole position, jockeying with the Eagles and, and the Niners. This move makes sense. And I think when we do it in combination with the whole offseason thus far, it does put it into picture what they're doing. They're not adding depth. Reader is a starter. Carlton Davis is a starter. These guys, specifically in this scheme, will be plus players. The only knock would be there are injury concerns with both more than the average NFL player. But I think this offseason has been upgraded. I, I think it's a B offseason right now. And so what we, we've we discussed this over the past week, since Monday, since the, the legal tampering period, which after yesterday's news with Atlanta and, and – uh, who else was uh, oh uh, the Philadelphia yeah, the, the Eagles thing like that that whole legal tampering thing it's and nonsense. and you can't do it the right way that's BS uh, th- it completely makes my head hurt to think that the NFL is going to bitch and moan about how they they want people to legally tamper but um I, I, and you address this words do matter mm-hmm. and when you when you lead with DJ Reader is somewhat redundant. It kind of has a negative connotation, but you're able to be critical. We don't have to agree with what Brad Holmes does 100% of the time. And whether it's Dan Campbell in the course of going forward on fourth and short or fourth and goal or any of the decisions, we can be critical of that. But, but John, this, is see, a, but- this is a team that was really good at stopping the run. They've you- added to that strength. It's- Probably but, but, a better way to put it. Well, but okay, fine. But do you realize how silly that is that it's negative to tell people you have an elite run defense already? That was the negative comment that I made was that your defense is already elite against the run. That was me being the bad guy. That to me shows you where the line has moved in terms of how this team is expected to be discussed. There was it, it's guys, read beyond five words. Context, big picture, full real discussion that isn't just surface level. Come on, you know people just read headlines. I, I, John, that's, I know. That's, that's, okay. that's societal and that's, but, that's but a different here's, direction. Here's the other thing. If we talk about all the time, hey, you want to make sure that you keep an asset a set, an asset, and yeah. the offensive line. This is kind of where I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it going, maybe we have underwhelmed or overlooked, and that is on the offensive line. I was okay with Jonah Jackson not coming back and not paying him $17 million a year, but I still want to address the depth of the interior offensive line. That was probably, and I think it's kind of a consensus, the number one reason of the success of this football team. Offensively, Jared Goff felt comfortable. He was able; They were able to run the ball. They were able to throw the ball. And they haven't addressed that. But on the opposite side, they were a good run team. Defense. And yeah. you get a chance to continue to strengthen that. So keep a strength, a strength. Make an asset, an even better asset, by adding DJ Reader with a couple of more skill sets. And to be fair... I had the whole top 50 free agents thing. DJ Reader is a top 50 free agent addition for this football team. Yep. And it is in the trenches where you and I have both emphasized you win football games. So this is a good move. And if Carlton Davis was a free agent, I think he would have been a top 50 guy. So while they didn't get one of the top five or top 10 guys, while they didn't sink $25 million into one player, between the two of them, it's about $25 million bucks, And you got two, two top 50 players who are at positions that will make this defense better next season. 
Yeah, and so they did go out and add somebody that is going to add to this defense. They they went out uh, on the on the on the on the secondary and added to the defense to make it better. And I think the question is, how much better do you expect this defense to be? Because last year they were right, you know, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. The year before, thirty two. Mm-hmm. Right. So they improved year over year, and now this year you're expecting them to. I would think. They would be a team that would get into the discussion of somewhere between 8 and 12. And if that's the case, do you think that this defense, just as it is on paper, should be expected to be somewhere in that 8 to 12 range? Because if you pair an 8 to 12 defense with a top three offense, what do you get? You get a team you to win a, the Super Bowl. A damn good football team. Yeah. And and not only is DJ Reader a top 50 and depending on where you're looking yeah. or, you know around the Marcus Davenport he was 60 is I think the si- the highest I've seen him rank so he, he was right there as well they've added talent to this defense but there's some ifs that come along with it if Davis can stay healthy if Reader can stay healthy if Davenport can stay healthy, but we could also say that about Jared Goff. If Jared Goff can stay healthy, he's got n- no real history of injury. Well, that, that's the difference. That, that's the only difference is Carlton Davis has missed time each of the last three seasons. Reader's got two quads and he's 30 and they're only guaranteeing $9 million. Like there is, I'm not, yes, anybody needs to stay healthy. Everybody needs to stay healthy. There's specific reason to say that with these guys, but this is out of the homes mold where these are short-term commitments where if they hit, it's a big hit, and if they miss, relatively minor. It's not gonna. It's not gonna haunt them for years to come if DJ Reader doesn't replicate what he's done in the past. And going back to what Brad Holmes has preached, and Dan Campbell as well, in, in his in his time with the media at the combine, it's about being able to continue to sign depth and increase the depth. You even talked about it. It was depth, 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 <laughs> depth, depth, depth. Um, that's where you look at this and say, are they? Can they still be? an elite run-stopping defense without D.J. Reader. The components are still there well, from last well, year. They were. I mean, if they had brought back Benito Jones and a Bugs type of player, last year was good enough for them to be an elite run defense. Okay, so th- those components are still there. So that's where you go and you look and say, well, is this a gamble? Is it an upgrade? Yes, if healthy. If he's not available, they still have the opportunity to go out there and still be a, a very a good, good to elite yes. run stopping defense. That's my question now about the offensive line. If Frank Ragnow goes down, Graham Glasgow goes to center, what do they do at both at, at both guard positions? Owosika, he's proven that he could step in and play. Is he going to be your starter going in? Kobe Sorsdahl, is that who you are relying on to play that right guard spot if Glasgow has to go to center? That's where I, I have a question about the depth of this team right now. It's a good conversation. We want you guys in the mix. 248-539-9797. Your view of the offseason so far now that DJ Reader's in the mix. It's 971. All right, here we go. FanDuel, number one. From upsets to buzzer beaters, nothing compares to college basketball in March. And, hey, last year, if you had Purdue over Fairleigh Dickinson, it didn't work out. Sometimes you're wrong, and you're on the wrong end of those moments. That's why FanDuel is giving everyone a no-sweat bet from now until March 20th. It doesn't matter if you're new to FanDuel or you already have an account. You're going to get bonus bets back if your bet doesn't win. You can even use your no-sweat bet on a college basketball parlay. So put a little bit together, put a lot together, put down a little, and win a lot. So download the FanDuel Sportsbook app if you don't already have it by doing so at FanDuel.com slash Jansen. That's FanDuel.com slash Jansen. And make every moment more with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. 
must be 21 or over and present in Michigan. Refund issued is now with trouble. Bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Max refund $5 unless otherwise specified. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problems? Call 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help. Number two... Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook right now. New customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. And all you got to do is pound something hey, that you think is a sure thing. You put down five and you're going to win $200 in bonus bets. Again, 200 bucks. To use on point spreads, money lines, you can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Jansen and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash Jansen. Must be 21 or over in present Michigan. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit is required. Bonus issued as now withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problems? Call one 800 Two seven zero seven one one seven for confidential help. Ticket Texter, signing reader is nice, but it's part of the team that already performed well. I'm more excited about the Davenport signing. He has the potential to solidify 
the defensive line opposite Hutchinson. That's from Brian on the ticket text. Yeah, I think the the wow moments are probably more there with Davenport than they are with Reader, but you, you're probably going to get more consistency, more consistent production that may be glossed over with Reader. Davenport's the one that if it hits... Oof. It's former first-round pick, and while healthy in his first three years, performed admirably, and, and, and you could say even at a high level. Then, the, he, then it has been riddled with injuries. The last two years, two and a half total sacks, which is why, I mean, for both parties' sake, it's a one-year deal. Right. Lions for, aren't committed beyond one year if he disappoints, and if he hits, he'll hit the incentives and the escalators. He'll hit the incentives, escalators, and for him as a player, he wants to, this would be when he would get to that second contract, the all-desired you know desired second deal if he gets... I don't know. Let's just say he comes out with 10 to 12 sacks this year. That is wonderful yep. for the Detroit Lions, but it also works well for him because then he's going to hit the open market again and the Lions will have a chance to extend or or you know re-up him if if they can afford it. If not, he's a guy that helped you for one year, proved it, and then he can move on somewhere else because that injury risk doesn't go away. Josiah in Lake Orion says getting DJ is huge. I love the signing. Can't wait to see the pass rush get even better. Low key, a better pass rusher. I mean, 330 pounds, yeah. only nine career sacks, but people don't realize pushing the pocket. Yeah. And he's going to make other people better pass rushers too. This will help the pass rush, but that's that's like a little more, you know, that's not surface level. It's a little deeper. Well, breakdown. It's, it's under the radar. Yeah. And he's not the guy that's going to be getting the, the pressure numbers. He's not the guy that's going to be getting the sack numbers, but if he provides a couple of more, I mean, Lee McNeil had what five sacks last year. Yeah. If he gets seven, all right, that's that's a positive. If Aiden Hutchinson, because a quarterback can't step up in the pocket, and all of a sudden he's right there, and and instead of eleven and a half in the regular season, he gets fifteen. How about Trey Hendrickson? Last three years, forty sacks, playing on a line with DJ Reader. Yeah, I think those go hand in hand. Ticket texture says Jim, just maybe avoid social media like some adults at your station. But no, you need the attention. I like to, I like talking to you guys on social media, going back and forth. I reply to more people than than most do because I like the conversation. And sometimes it turns into a shouting match, but that, welcome to social media. Yeah. Another one says, I like the signing, but I will point out the redundancy just in case it doesn't work so I can take credit either way. Signed, cookies. <laughs> Fair point. Fair point. <laughs> Another one says, does this mean Broderick Martin was a bust? Why isn't he playing more? Todd. Well, you're going to have a continual uh, rotation in there. And that's the one thing that you see about defensive lines and defensive linemen. They can't play every snap. Um, and that's kind of one of the knocks I've always had on defensive linemen. They need a breather. All right. And so when, when they talk about, you know, offense, hey, you had 75 plays in a game. Well, offensive linemen are out there for all 75. Uh, defensive linemen, there are probably out there for. Most of them, right around 45, the good ones, 45 to 50 of those snaps. Even Aiden Hutchinson's not out there for every snap, and they're more the, the pursuit guys, all that stuff. But if you've got Aleem McNeil and DJ Reader as your starters, now you've got Broderick Martin that should be in the mix this year. We didn't see him much last year, and hopefully he can learn from a guy like DJ Reader because DJ Reader's only under contract for two years. They may have told him, hey, you're here for two years. We're going to move on. They probably didn't say it in, in those terms. <laughs> I was going to say, welcome but, to the team. <laughs> but we, but they have that ability to move on because hopefully at that point, that's where Broderick Martin is really coming into his own. They're going to sprinkle him in, get him some experience, and find out really what they need to know about Broderick Martin. Before we get to Heather's news, Ed and Waterford, we were talking a little wings earlier, boot off the ice last night. What are you seeing? Uh, yeah, I mean, morning, guys. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Um, the... You know, my biggest gripe with the Red Wings right now is uh, I think their decor is just, they're getting, you know, getting up there in age. They're, you know, they look slow on the ice. You know, they're they're getting sucked into one side. They're getting caught with their pants down on the backside. Um, you know, we just got to bring some young guys in with a little bit of fire. You know, we need to light a fire under this team right now. You're right. It's it's. Petrie and Sherratt the other night together on the same pair at least split them up. But yeah, it, oh, it's, it's, it's yeah a lot of Ed, it's you're right. You're seeing like flat footed stuff. It's like I don't want to accuse guys of watching the puck, but that's what it looks like from TV. Like, come on, guys, yeah. pick pick up the skates. <laughs> let's let's canvas the entire D zone. Let's not give up easy um, cross ice passes that give people uh, sweet spots in the slot and in the shooting lanes. 
Exactly. And I think, you know, once we, you know, get a couple of these young guys in and, you know, maybe we pick up the pace a little bit with the skates, uh, the offense starts clicking. You know, I'm a big mantra of, you know, defense creates offense. And we get, you know, I think it was uh, the Buffalo game. They, you know, they had close to, I mean, half the period they were in our uh, defense mm-hmm. zone. You know, they were on just firing our offense, everything like that. And we were just getting shelled in that first period and couldn't really do anything about it. And you're not going to win that way. Appreciate it, Ed. Enjoy the weekend. We'll talk more about the uh, NFC North coming up before the hour ends, a move the Bears made last night. But first, Heather with the news. So separate juries found both James and Jennifer Crumbly guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Good. Both parents were convicted on four counts of this involuntary manslaughter and will be sentenced on April 9th. Now, Involuntary manslaughter is punishable by up to 15 years in prison, and both are expected to appeal their conviction. They do say that appealing a jury verdict is rare, but because of this case. The unprecedentedness of it. Yeah. Well, they are setting a precedent, and I would imagine that because the the stakes are so high, I would be shocked if they didn't appeal. Agreed. They, but they say usually appeals are kind of lost in the shuffle where this sure. will probably get looked at a little bit more closely. So is your car spying on you? Mm, Turns out mm, it could mm, be drivers of cars manufactured by GM and Honda and a bunch of other popular brands say that their insurance rates went up after the company sent data about their driving to these issuers without their knowledge. So there's one guy that says his insurance costs soared by 21% in 2022 after GM's OnStar smart driver computerized system, which is installed in his Chevy Bolt collected information about the particulars of his driving habits. So according to this driver, um, his insurance company received information about like the start and end times of his trips, which aren't really the concerning part. It's more of um, the instances of speeding, hard braking, and sharp accelerations that did it. They also looked at distance driven and Things like that. So it's not just electric vehicle owners that are complaining about this. Yep. There's other drivers. One driver of a Cadillac in particular says that he's contemplating a lawsuit against GM after he was denied car insurance by seven different companies in December based off of information that was being sent from the same OnStar system to these insurance agencies. Yeah, it's so they they. They sell you on, well, we're going to give you a driving report because we're monitoring this to help you be a better driver. But then on the backside of it, it's who they're sharing this information with. It's not just you. Obviously, it's with the insurance companies as well. And there's a difference because some insurance companies have things you can opt into to get discounts, but you are right. choosing to do that. This is without your knowledge. Right, according to, according yes. to these according people, to, yes. yes. I, I haven't really looked into it deeply but yeah the reporting now yeah. ford has said hey we offer systems like this but but you know about this if we're going to send it to anybody else and they don't do that you have a you have to opt a in disclaimer. or opt out yeah. and a disclaimer that you have to read before you say yes or no well we know everybody system. reads those mm-hmm. <laughs> no you should every little, i know you should john but <laughs> but everything you download an app and there's this disclaimer you just go whoop, 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 Agree. accept mm-hmm. agreed yep. you don't usually yep. read through those maybe we yes. should Uh, Jerry Stackhouse is out after five season as Vanderbilt's basketball coach. So the move uh, was termed as a mutual parting of ways. And it came two days after they lost 90 to 85 in overtime to Arkansas in the opening round of the SEC tournament. So he had, I guess, signed a contract extension before the 22-23 season. And the school is now expected to pay a significant buyout. We don't know the exact terms. He's going to get paid. But it sounds like it could be more than fifteen million dollars. Yeah, so yeah. he's nobody ever wants to lose their job. If if you're gonna lose it and you walk away with fifteen million bucks, it's easier to handle the loss. I'm sorry. Did, yeah. did you say Jerry Stackhouse? <laughs> yes. Did did you mean Jawan Howard? Seriously, what's the weight on that, John? What do we come on? Come on. Uh, I I don't know. I, I I honestly I've got no answer for you. Okay. Um but yeah, getting back to a friend of the program, we've had him on before. Yeah. Um nobody wants like I said, nobody wants to lose their job, no. but 15 million bucks. Yeah, it's, it's much easier cost, when you got... <laughs> not going to cost that know, program we just talked coming. about that much. Uh, Aaron Rodgers back in the news. He has uh, responded to claims that he is a Sandy Hook conspiracy theorist. So it was alleged that 
he had floated these conspiracy theories about the Sandy Hook shooting in a private conversation. This came from a CNN reporter that claimed back in 2013 she was at the Kentucky Derby. They had conversations and he had expressed that he felt it was actually a government inside job and that the media was intentionally ignoring it. Well, he has come out and he says that he does not believe nor does he associate with any of these possible conspiracy yeah. theories. As much as you think he's a weirdo, um, I, I think he, he hit the nail on the head on that one. It's, you know, it's a, it's a horrific yes. event. It's Heather with the news. It's 97 one.
Yeah, that happened last night, too. Wings boot off the ice. Seven straight losses. Talk a little college hoops before the hour ends. Michigan State won yesterday. And, of course, the comment I made about Juwan Howard, we should talk a little bit about the state of both programs. There's also some news last night in the division. Keenan Allen is a Chicago Bear. Hmm. Now, John, I didn't see this because this broke like right as the head hit the pillow last night, but it's the first thing I saw this morning. My reaction was, let's get to make this quarterback that they draft's life easier. Say what you want about Keenan Allen, a little long in the tooth. Possession receiver, reliable dude, move the sticks. He had a big game against the Lions this year. He had a big game against a lot of guys this last season. He's expensive, but who the hell are the Bears paying? They only gave up a fourth-round pick. What was your read? This is a team that is doing all they can to make sure whether it's Justin Fields when nobody believes it's going to be Justin Fields um, or Caleb Williams as successful as possible as a rookie. And, okay, you look and you say, well, they've signed or re-signed 13 different guys. And offensively, what are they trying to do? Okay, they got a little bit of insurance with a backup quarterback, Brett Rippon. Uh, okay, whatever. That's 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 no big deal. Patrick Scales, long snapper. Again, who cares? <laughs> but everybody else that they've done – Obviously, Keenan Allen, they want to pair him with DJ Moore to give your quarterback that one-two punch down the field. A tight end, Gerald Everett, a very quality player that they can go and pair with already Cole Komet, their tight end, a a quality duo. Offensive line, this is a team that has struggled to protect Justin Fields. You can say whatever you want about him, but he has basically been running for his life. Now, he's very good at doing that, (laughs) but he has been under duress more than almost any quarterback in the past three years. And they go out and they sign a center. They sign a couple of guys to develop the depth of this offensive line. And now you're looking at it going, okay. You know, and they they obviously re-signed Jalen Johnson, uh, you know, to a four-year contract. This is a team. Defensively, we know they're a good team. Mm -hmm. They've they've played really good defense, added the linebackers last year. And now this year they're addressing – something that they should have done a long time ago with Justin Fields and giving a young quarterback in this league the the weapons at his disposal and the protection, they're 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 kind of doing that. And and not only on top of that is spending in free agency, they've got a heck of a lot of draft capital. They got the number one overall pick. We talk about Caleb Williams and they've got the number nine overall pick. They can continue to add so much talent to this team. They did something that, that Brad Holmes does very well, which is keep their options open for the draft. Most people and this is, whatever, it's still March. Most people assumed it'd be quarterback at one, wide receiver at nine. I don't think they have to take a receiver at nine. They've got DJ Moore. They've got Keenan Allen. They may take a receiver at nine, but they've kept their options open where they could address BPA, best yeah. player available. How formidable are the Bears? Like, I think most people think the Packers are the biggest threat to the Lions. The Bears with a rookie quarterback probably not winning the division right away. But long term, I do think they're building something here. I agree. Long term, they they do become a concern. And what do they do at the quarterback position? And how do they develop that next quarterback? Most people believe it's going to be Caleb Williams when he comes in. How do they give him the tools to be successful early on in his first NFL season? And then what does it look like in week 10, 11, 12? We saw it with, with Jordan Love. And yeah, he had a chance to sit, which I think is the ideal situation in Green Bay. But he got better at the end of the season when they started to have some some guys get a little bit healthier. They started to protect him a little bit more. He played better. And in, I think in the long term, if that's the answer for them at the quarterback position, he's a solid quarterback. Green Bay becomes an issue. It's a very good division. And if they can develop Caleb Williams, give him the, the ability to zero in on a couple of things, be good at just a couple of things. We don't need you to do everything that – You know, you're looking at Patrick Mahomes does or any of these other quarterbacks. We just need you to be solid. This can become a team that's going to beat some teams this year. And then in the coming years, as they continue to add to their level of talent and experience and develop these players. Yeah, they're they're two or three years down the road. They're a force. They started 0-4. They finished 7-10. and Game above 500 for the rest of the way. They were especially at the end of the season, a team that was kind of a pest. Mm -hmm. Gave you a hard time. Beat the Lions. They split the series with the Lions last season, and they have a bunch of cap space and a bunch of draft picks, and they're taking a quarterback at number one. We would think it's going to be Caleb Williams. He pans out. They're going to be a problem for a very long time. Now, the Lions are in a great position because they've got a nucleus that they've already drafted and developed that they're going to be able to retain and keep and build from. They're a couple years ahead. They're, They're a couple years ahead. 
two four eight five three nine ninety seven ninety seven. You got thoughts on what happened in the division overnight? Like pecking order: Lions one, Packers two, Bears three, Vikings four. Are you with me on that? I know yeah, a lot of people are like so. excited about the Vikings so far. They don't have a quarterback. Well, they don't. Yeah, that's the thing. You're going to go into this year with Sam Darnold as your quarterback. Um, now, most people believe they're going to try and trade up to get one of the quarterbacks, but then you're talking about a rookie quarterback, and it's not going to be the number one overall pick. That's not always the, hey, you got to have that guy. But defensively, they've been a very good team. Now they lose Daniil Hunter, but they add Jonathan Green- Greenard and Andrew Van Ginkle. Like, they did a good job of, of losing talent, but then adding back some of the talent that they lost. And, and Justin Jefferson, the the curious thing to me is going to be Justin Jefferson. Yeah. Because if he, obviously he's already, it's been reported that he's turned down a contract like Tyreek Hill. Mo, the, a lot of people believe he's 1-2 or 2-1 in terms of ranking as a receiver in the NFL. He's right there at the top. Does he look at this and say, you know what, I want to demand a trade because I don't want to go through a year with Sam Darnold or a rookie quarterback? Or at the end of this year, does he pull a power play and say, I, w- I want out, even if you're going to franchise me, I want out because I, you know, whoever you draft, it's not going to be good enough or they're not at least going to be good enough in the meat of my career. Yeah, there's a combustibility there with, with Minnesota that I don't think the other teams are, are at all dealing with. An uncertainty in Minnesota more than any of the other teams are dealing with. So you got a pecking order. Throw them in the ticket text. Jump on the phone. 248-539-9797. Little college hoops. Michigan State won. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was, uh, they kept saying over and over on the broadcast, this is exactly how an 8-9 matchup should be. And close. Lead changes. Low scoring. Back and forth. And Izzo made the decision, you know, Lake Hall's got three fouls. I'm going to go with him anyway. And, and he was great. And they, they closed that thing out and did it by 10 points. Nice little mm-hmm. cushion at the end. Michigan State in the tournament. No debates, no questions. They're in. They'll play Purdue today at noon. Do you give them a shot? Oh, sure. I mean, you, you always give them a shot. And when you're talking about, especially yesterday, when you looked and you said, okay, they're down two going into half, and then they outscore Minnesota by 12 in the second half. Mm-hmm. This is a team led by, and we mentioned it yesterday, if they can get some of those junior seniors, Tyson Walker, Hogart, Hall, to step up and play well, which is what they did. Now, they turned the ball over early in that game a lot yep. more than they, they they have been this season. They were a little careless with it, but I believe they'll probably tighten up those things. Now they got to play Purdue today. Do they have a shot? Sure, they have a shot. But this is a team that, instead of just being on the bubble, after yesterday, they're clearly in. Yeah, they're not going to be left out, even if you don't love the resume or they're getting too much credit for losing to good teams. They're in. They're going to be in the tournament. Now it comes down to matchups. Yep. You get into the into the tournament, and it's are, are, are they a 10? Are they 11? They're probably closer to the 10 line now. But what are the matchups that they have throughout the course of their, you know, their, their route? Well, and think about this, too. This is we're going to find out on Sunday. If you end up as a 10... You get the 7-10 matchup and you avoid a one seed. If you end up in the 8-9 and you win your first matchup, you draw the one seed in the opening weekend. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not if, suggesting they if, should if, lose if, this game to hold the 10 seed. I'm just no, saying but those, if they those beat are the Purdue, they'll probably bump up. Sure. Yeah, they'd probably end up on the 8-9 and then yeah. they'd be a you know, game away from playing a one seed in the second game of the NCAA tournament. Sure. So there's, there's your Spartan update. I do want to know where Michigan basketball fans are at when we wrap the hour up, just because there are coaching moves being made in the sport. Jerry Stackhouse, after uh, you know, the game last night, let go at Vandy. Stanford made a coaching change. I know Wojo's written columns in the Detroit News about Jawan's status at Michigan. You would think, like any day now, they would make a move. I also saw something. I think it was the Athletic. This jumped out to me. Michigan hired an external firm to access to assess the culture of their men's basketball program. That's the latest from the Athletic. If you're Hiring a firm to assess the culture of your program, it's probably not a good sign that the culture is very good. So I do want to talk a little bit about the Wolverines to wrap up. It's 
before we get to the latest on Michigan hoops from the athletic John, we got some breaking news NFL draft trade involving the division. You got this? Uh, I do have this. Uh, Tom Pelissario is reporting that uh, the Minnesota Vikings have traded with the Houston Texans. It's a first round pick, number 23 overall from the Texans going to the Vikings. Here's what Minnesota gets number 23 this year and number 232. So they have now two first round picks, number 11 and 23, and Houston gets number 42 this year, number 188 this year, and a second rounder in 25. So two two second rounders that Houston gets, one this year and one next, and pick number 188. And it's clearly to me they're trying to build enough draft capital, Minnesota is, with 11 and 23, and I was just trying to pull up the draft value chart to go up and get a quarterback. Yeah, that's what this really feels like, right? That's the takeaway. 12 and 23 for a team that doesn't have a long-term answer at quarterback. And a group, a draft that has maybe four guys that could go in the top 10. This is a move that lets them jump up and get somebody. Yeah, this, if you're just going by the draft value chart... In regards to where everyone is picking, now we know Chicago has the first pick. They don't have enough if you wanted to trade both first to jump up to Chicago, and and I doubt that Chicago would would trade in division like that, although they have shown, you know, mm-hmm. they've dealt with the Lions. Um, Washington at number two. I don't think Washington's going to move on from that pick after uh, trading Sam Howell yesterday. They could go as high as four, Three or four with New England and Arizona, if they want to trade both picks, that's that's the 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 highest they could go to try and grab one of the top quarterbacks. And typically, you have a guy in mind. You're not trading up to get one of two or three guys. There's typically a guy in mind, right? You've done your homework, you've done your evaluation, you met with the guy at the combine, you saw him throw. Is it, is it JJ? Is it May? Is it Daniels? Well, it, and, and some of that will depend on, okay, are you going to sit at 11 and take the quarterback that falls to you? I don't think you make this trade thinking you're just going to stay stand pat no. at 11. You're going to be moving up, and how high do they want to go and who is available? Because we've talked at six, the Giants possibly jumping into the pool again with, with JJ so or, got- or anybody else that would be available at that point. So you try to get in front of them. You trade up to four or five, Arizona or Los Angeles, the Chargers. Maybe I, I got to believe Arizona, you know, with with their quarterback situation, Kyler Murray, it sounds like they're going to stick with him. So weird as, as that situation has been. And the Chargers, obviously with, with Justin Herbert, they're not going to go quarterback. So if you're going to make this trade, I, I, I really think they've got to be eyeing New England to try and go up to three to ensure that they get one of the top three guys. If you just settle for four and trade with Arizona and you're sitting there going, well, okay, we got number four. If, if, if it goes one, two and three, is that really worth jumping up for that? Whoever is the fourth best evaluated in this draft? No, that doesn't make sense. This is something that's very interesting. This just broke like, like right as we were coming moments back. Yeah. Moments ago. Again, the trade. And, And again, I'm just, I'm just, I'm spitballing here. Yeah, because it is so fresh and new. Minnesota is going to pick up an extra first in exchange for basically two twos and and another pick thrown in there. Yeah, and obviously, I mean, you can throw in another, you know, another player to sweeten the pot, or you know, hey, is it is it is it twenty three and eleven and a later pick? In this year's draft or, or, or next year's future, pick future, or yeah, future pick. They've already yeah. given up a future second, but yeah, depending on how bold they want to get. There were reports last year they were trying to move up, and, and now without Kirk Cousins, there's more of an urgency to do it. I, I mentioned The Athletic has a story out about Michigan basketball. The, the couple quotes, and again, this, this is out within the last hour or two, so I'm skimming and trying to give you guys relevant quotes. Uh, this comes from uh, the, the rift in the athletic department. Um, uh, Sanderson, the strength coach, left. He's now at Illinois. Yep. His representation uh, contacted Michigan claiming that there's a culture of fear within the men's basketball program and that uh, that there was fear from retaliation that Howard 
had prevented staff from coming forward previously. That's uh, from Stapleton, the attorney. He wrote in a letter to Ward Manuel on December 11th. Sanderson claims that Howard approached his son Jet visibly angry during the 2022-23 practice and threatened, I'll slap the bleep out of you. Adding the incident sparked a lot of internal conversation. Uh, Sanderson said one coach on the staff saw Juwan manhandle Jet uh, and uh, was upset with how Jet's treatment was handled. Other allegations leveled by Sanderson include bullying directed towards members of the coaching staff and others. Quote, there are troubling issues within the program, and it's clear that head coach Jawan Howard has created an intolerable environment for both staff and student athletes, Stapleton wrote in the letter. Michigan declined to comment to the Athletics, citing a previous statement that Manuel plans to review the program after the season. Season's over. Debate's going to be about yeah, why what, Jawan Howard's still the head coach. Yeah, and when are you, Even regardless of this incident, just the record on the court is enough to dismiss the guy. Yeah, and then you, you you go with what is being reported in The Athletic and the environment, along with some of the actions that we've seen very publicly, you know, uh, slapping another coach. That was on TV, in, yeah. In, 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 you know, post-game, in a handshake line. Like, at some point, where does the zero tolerance that they talked about come in? Yeah, Eaton 24 should do it. <laughs> yeah, that I should mean, be. You should need the, this report. I mean, yeah. all the outside stuff, that's, that, that's fodder for – should have been let go a long time ago. Yep. Eight and twenty-four is why you go. Mm-hmm. I mean, first, I mean that's that's the easy button, right? You would think. You would think. Yeah. I mean, worst record in history. Yeah. Why is there even a debate? I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. What do you guys got coming up today on a Friday? Now what, <laughs> Doug? <laughs> this Red Wing team. Yeah. Uh, uh, Seriously. Now uh, what? Mm-hmm. Uh. It'd mostly be Red Wings and DJ Reader. Um, there's a lot of other stuff that we will touch on throughout the program. But. How about how about three in a row? It's a chance, man. There's this. There's a chance. So you're saying there's a, there's chance. a chance. One Look, in a million. You got you got to you got to prepare for the stretch run if you're Miami. If you're you're thinking about it, we got to really we we should be able to beat the Pistons without our top two players. Right. We got back to back against them. We don't need them. Bam. Yeah. We don't need Jimmy Butler. Sit them down tonight and they're tired. Know, then start because you, you're on the road. I mean, play those guys at home. You don't want to rest the guys at home. Rest them on the road. They should rest them yeah. tonight. I said one in a million. It's actually one in eighty-two. This is their chances of winning this game. There you go. I don't think that's how probability works, but <laughs> no. no. Um, <laughs> but I like the math effort. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to spin this in a positive manner just, because I know I know Doug is Kate, is, is going to be we're all glued for to the TV. I'm betting against him, and I'm pulling for him. Are Kate, you going to watch it? Yeah, and Kate's questionable, which I don't oh, know. oh Doug, no, but. which which even more Houston. If Kate doesn't play, then you sit down a, th- a third. If you're Miami, if you're you? Miami, sure, yeah. 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 It just needs to be said. Doug, you said they would win three in a row at a time where the Pistons, I don't believe, had three wins on the season. No, I mean I look, it it was This is true. It was a they were two and it one. was a bold <laughs> it was a bold uh bet, but um I still believe. I still believe. Still time on the clock. That is correct. There you go. It's Carson Anderson. over. So the punter catches the ball and oh, actually no. gets the punt off. <laughs> do you? How often do you think about that? Uh, not as often as you'd think. <laughs> <laughs> I think this last year might make that a little easier. Yeah. 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 Uh, Carson Anderson next, 97-1. Brought to you by North Bloomfield Properties. Things are getting tense in Hockey Town. That's Ken Daniels and Mickey Redmond for Valley Sports Detroit trying to make the call over that chorus of boos cascading down from the LCA crowd last night. Wings losing to the Coyotes 4-1, to putting the winless drought at 7. Detroit tied for the Eastern Conference's last wild card spot with the Islanders, who have a game in hand on the Wings. Pistons going for three straight wins, something they haven't done in over two years, bringing Miami into LCA tonight, here right here on 97-1, starting at 635. Michigan State gets another shot at Purdue at noon today in the Big Ten tournament. Sparty came up six points short in West Lafayette two weeks ago. Boilermakers a seven and a half point favorite today. And most adults are against college athletes unionizing. 
An Associated Press survey found that 55% of Americans 18 and older oppose unionization. The issue appears to be developing along partisan political lines. White people and adults 45 and older disagree with college athletes unionizing by two to one margin. Republicans oppose it three to one. Most people of color, those between 18 and 44, and Democrats support it. At the Corwell Health Update Desk, I'm Beanie Howell. For more, go to 971 The Ticket or Odyssey.com. It's uh, it's time for a Friday. Friday. Hell yeah. Friday. Oh, you, you think so, huh? I think you want to. You want to go that route? What do you mean? The old intro. I love that intro. There we go. Hell yeah. There you go. Thank you, Kay. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm, am I feeling it? Okay, hold on. Time out. Time out. It's a Friday, and you, quote, are not feeling it? Kang, Gator's not feeling a Friday. I'm going to be honest with you, Doug. I'm not feeling it either. <laughs> okay, you're not feeling it because you're not feeling well. Yeah. Kang's playing hurt today. That's probably why I'm... Didn't play the open. It was accidental, by the way. All right. Sorry. My heart is hurt, Doug. What's wrong? I mean, that game last night. I was oh. there at LCA, and it was just, I was hoping that maybe if I went, saw things, I could see a, a, a W up close and in person. It's been a while since I've been to a game. Mm-hmm. I was trying to do my part. Yep. And uh, it didn't, didn't matter. It just didn't matter. And... It's just depressing. I mean, this is they, they took on Arizona again. Coyotes are not a good hockey team. No. And they have outscored the Red Wings eight to one in the two games they played in the last week. Mm-hmm. Eight to one to Arizona. And this one at home, I mean, it, it there wasn't a good vibe in the building to start. You know, it wasn't a it wasn't a, a slam packed LCA crowd, which I guess I wouldn't have expected, but um just kind of you know, people sitting and watching the game, not not too fired up beforehand, and no reason to get fired up. You know, the loudest it got was when there was that scrum when uh, you know, Lucas Raymond was going at it with somebody, and then here comes Ben Sherratt, as if to say the only person that gets to fight Lucas Raymond is me. Mm-hmm. Which would because that's what they didn't practice the day before. It was kind of awesome. Like, I, I mean, seriously, I'm thinking to myself, "Where's the jump start moment?" And and you were hoping that was going to be it. I was hoping that was going to be it, and it wasn't. The wings were trailing at that time. I went and put a dollar down on them to win the game. I was like, "That this is they're they're coming back. This is the moment. The, these two players fight in practice on a on a on a Wednesday." And then fight together against Arizona on a Thursday. A shot of the two of them, Sherratt and Raymond, in the penalty box together. I'm like, this is perfect. This is exactly the spark, right? <laughs> I mean, it was nope. it was just downright depressing. I mean, I got yep. the final game notes here in my hand. It just, I mean, a, a sluggish, lethargic-looking power play. Afterwards, Derek Lalone said, "Yeah, there was didn't have the jump." And I'm like, "How do you not? Have How do you the not? Jump? Yeah, it, there's. First of all, like you said, where's the moment? But where's the scoring chances? They're not dangerous now, at, at all. There, I mean, th- there were some, but but not many. But not not enough, and and they weren't it, it, like the, the chances that they got." When they were on the winning streak, or or just you know from from January first to to March first, they were scoring on those chances. Now, nope, not not even a, an opportunity, you know. And a, a nice pass across the uh, across the, the 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 crease, and there's a guy ready for the one timer, and you know the pass is just a bit off, or mm-hmm. they just miss it altogether. And hey, you got this opportunity to come in, and you shoot the puck into the upper chest of the. The goaltender instead of sniping a corner. I mean, it's those little things yeah. that aren't happening on the opportunities that they have, and those opportunities are few and far between. 
And you're watching this team, and you know, it came to the realization yesterday during the show that what the Red Wings are is an average team in the NHL. Average teams make the playoffs. Yep. They're an average team in the NHL, but they're playing well below average right now. I was talking to some people before the game last night in the organization and in a way in the organization and talking to them about you know what, what they think is going on. And, and it's like the ex, there are no explanations, but there are things that you see that you say. And, and one of the things was said was this is – this team is playing so far below what their capabilities are. That's what's frustrating. Is it, you don't have to play superstar level like they were when they were on that streak, or or like they were since January first. But you've got to play to a level that is expected, and they are so far below that level. It it it's not just having um, Dylan Larkin out because that's an excuse. Okay, what do people say? What what does Dan Campbell say? What what's the Lions mentality when somebody gets hurt? Well, everybody's mentality is next man up. Next man up. Exactly, yeah. right? And yeah. I know it's, you know, is it different in, in football when you have a bigger roster and people plug in? I, I and There's more people on the field at one time? Sure, I get it. But at the same time, someone should step up and seize the opportunity that's in front of them right now, now that you're going to get more ice time. Okay. Or how about this? Guys, let's get it together here. Dylan's not here. We got to be better. And it's not only are they not scoring goals. They are giving up goals in bunches to bad teams, to some good teams too, but to bad teams. When you're giving up to Arizona and Arizona and Buffalo, it's not good. It's well, just not good. And I'm just trying to figure out, like, I, I I didn't expect, the loss of Larkin, I expected a step back, okay? And you said it's an excuse. And I think losing... Dylan Larkin on a team without a great margin for error. That's not a great hockey team. Losing Dylan Larkin is going to impact them, right? He's on the ice for roughly a third of the time. Is he that big a deal that that he draws that much of the other team's attention that it, it changes everything when he's not out there? Is, mean, that, is that, as far as tangible impact, is that account for 20 minutes of ice time where he is so so impactful that other teams so much focus on him that it opens up stuff for everybody else. And and I don't think I didn't think the answer was yes. I'm starting to consider that the answer might be yes. But but seriously, it feels like more than just Dylan Larkin. And 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 we got a head coach searching for answers, right? Line changes, pairing changes. Well, they changed switch the line a, a switch back bit last yeah. night. And I mean, no, switch no... back and practice fights, game fights, spark from the crowd. None of it's working. None of it's working. No, and, and, and there's an overriding big picture question over who's to blame for this and, and whether or not it goes up all the way to the top to Steve Eisenman. Is it Lalone? And then there's a little bit of take a deep breath in an eighty two game schedule. Yeah. There are stretches where you where you play like Mung. But this is now it's a seven game stretch. Mm-hmm. Now it now it has eclipsed what the winning streak was. It's completely erased that. Not only is it seven losses. I was sitting next to Nick Katsunika last night from NHL.com. And Nick's like, when was the last time this team lost seven games in regulation? Like not even recording a point because the game goes to overtime. And actually, technically, I don't think it was all that long ago, but it would seem like it would be forever ago. But just the fact that they've lost seven in a row without going to regulate, without. Uh, going to an extra period is is kind of crazy. And they made a couple of changes last night. There was no Sprong. Took him out of the lineup. You brought in Austin Sarnik. But Sarnik plays five minutes and 19 seconds. You know, Bergeron was brought up, and Bergeron played uh, nine minutes and 13 seconds. All right? You, yeah. you, Justin Hall taken out of the lineup and uh, on, uh, on defense. You know, it, it's like the Red Wings have... I tried describing it to somebody last night. It, it feels like their whole entire roster is mid to good. There's no great and there's no god awful. It's all just mid to good. So when you're talking about bringing somebody else up and giving them a chance, is that person you're bringing up are they already mid to good or are they just um, totally unknown? And at this point, I mean, you would just want them to do anything. Two four eight five three nine ninety seven ninety seven event session for Red Wing fans. We got some Lions stuff we'll get to. Obviously, with the signing of DJ Reader, mixing some basketball talk as well. It's a Friday. 
Time for a Friday here on Carson Anderson on 97.1 The Ticket. All right, so a culpability question. You know, I'm looking at this whole big picture with the Red Wings and what's going on. I'll start with this. The season's not over, okay? Don't pull the plug on your Red Wing enthusiasm and this team going to the playoffs. It's not over. Two weeks ago when they were playing lights out and reeling in upper echelon teams in the division and, oh, they're only this many points out of being the three seed, et cetera, et cetera. None of the reasonable takes were, hey, this team's winning the Stanley Cup. The, the hope was that they could make the playoffs and not be a polite first-round opponent, right? The hope was that they wouldn't be a team that got to the playoffs and felt a sense of satisfaction and, thank you, we'll let ourselves out. It was the hope was that this team could make the playoffs and make some noise. That felt like the ceiling. And no reasonable takes were. 
I think this team is winning the Stanley Cup. Two weeks later, I think it also stands to reason that it's not a reasonable take that the season is over. <laughs> and and we'll start with this. Dylan Larkin's season isn't over. Hope not. <laughs> and they are, doesn't sound like it. They, are the, they have been the worst team in hockey for the last two weeks. And they're not the worst team in hockey. We know this. So I I, I think I, I I I would just caution you against thinking that the season is over. And feel a sense of enthusiasm that better play is going to come because we've they've shown for the bulk of the season that they are capable of that. Now, here's the question though. If they miss the playoffs, I think for the first time. In his tenure, it's a reasonable take that Steve Eisenman should be feeling some heat, some serious heat. And I, I will state, I don't think they're going to miss the playoffs. I still think that they're playing so bad it's not representative of who they truly are. And we've talked about you know corrections and water finding its level. <laughs> I actually expect there to be a sizable bounce back here pretty soon. I've, I've, I've miscalled and miscalled when that pretty soon is going to be. And that's, that's fine. That's on me. That's not on them, (laughs) but they do need to turn it around rather quickly. And we know they've got the stuff to play better. We know they do. And I'm thinking back to the trade deadline where they didn't do anything to improve themselves in the here and the now. Is that because Eisenman knew that them in this quote contender area was a bit fraudulent? Do you think he knew that? Well, if he knew that, then wouldn't you have been more inclined to move away some of those guys that are free agents at the end of the year? And he might have tried. He might have tried. I don't think that's the case. I think what he I think what he expected was his team wasn't going to lose seven in a row. And I think that was quite evident when he spoke with Trevor Thompson between periods on last Friday night after the trade deadline. He you could see he was pissed with how the team had played. And he's like, you know, I'm, I'm backing you guys. I didn't move anybody out. I think we're a playoff team, and this is what you're still doing. And here it is a few games later, and they're still playing losing hockey. Um, I, I think one of the other frustrating things for fans and maybe for, for Eisenman too is figuring out what to do with Simon Edmondson. Now, he blocked a shot last weekend. He got banged up from that. I don't think he's returned since, but he's, I suppose, could return to, to hockey soon. But... If he's brought up, you got to send somebody. You got to send somebody packing. Yep, because that's the way the roster is right now, and that's the other unfortunate part of 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 having this mid roster. Is you only have I think it's one unrestricted free agent on on defense, and that's Gostaspair, and you need Gostaspair because he's so important with what he can do offensively. Um, so you can't just release him to do it. So then you're talking about releasing somebody who's under contract and that becomes a, 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 a more bitter pill to swallow. Yep. Um, but that's, so then you're left with, do you even bring Edmondson up? And look, I don't care if I have to drink beer out of a shoe or not. That's my shoot the boot guarantee that, that Edmondson was going to be brought up before the playoffs or, or for the playoffs. And, and he hasn't. And now it doesn't look like he will. Doesn't I don't care if I drink beer out of the shoe. The question is, is it the right move? And at this point in time, I'm not even sure if it's the right move. Yeah, I'm not sure either. I am it and 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 really as it stands right now, I think the non panic thing to do is to just keep going back to the well with this group that has played much better hockey. And also start many a Dylan Larkin appreciation thread on message boards. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because honestly, you know, I I I I thought he was a really good player. Okay, I didn't think he was a superstar. But what I'm not questioning is his value to this team. Well, now here's what can be argued: Dylan Larkin is so good that he got the best out of his teammates because when he leaves, the teammates aren't playing as well. Yeah, I mean, so guys maybe. like. Peron or Cop or Comfer, you know, where are they right now? You yep. know, um, they're just not showing up on a score sheet. You know, the only guys that are sporadically, Lucas Raymond is actually having quietly a really nice season. That shot last night was insane. One timer where he put it, it right. thing of beauty. Over the it's shoulder a high of the end, goal It's a high-end, yeah. you know, it's a goal scorer's goal. But 
And maybe just maybe Lucas Raymond is the guy that they need to continue to develop at the rate that he is where, hey, wait a minute, is Raymond actually, is he going to be a, a 40 goal scorer at some point in his career in the very near future? Um, is he a guy that's going to be destined for better than just being a good player? Mm -hmm. You got to hope for that because to find superstars in a league, you have to get lucky with the draft in terms of drafting up high or just have the best scouting department ever and find those nuggets throughout the draft where you get them. You can trade for one, but do you have enough capital to trade for it without decimating your, your future? Um, or can you sign one in free agency and good luck because those players never come available? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's that one thing that's looming out there. That's incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult to get. Now, as far as the reality where the wings are, they're tied for the last playoff spot, but the Islanders have a game in hand. So the Islanders are have a have a have a leg up on Detroit. This isn't an impossible task, okay? And there are games coming up, and there are games that they have played that are that aren't the hardest of opponents. Got it. They've gacked away opportunity after opportunity to beat those teams. But there's a lot of time and a lot of hockey to be played and a lot of good hockey to be played. And it feels like they've got some monster games coming up with, with Buffalo, with the Islanders, with teams that are right there in the mix or trying to get in the mix where the premium is high, with, where you can create that big game feel. Like, it just takes one win in one of these big games to completely change the overall feeling in a room. And right now, like when that horn went off last night and the the – Thousand or people so left at the end of the game, booed. It was loud, and there were there weren't that many people there. And those and that team trudged off the ice straight to the locker room in a, in a in a way that you could tell, like they're they're rattled right now. They are lost. They can't figure out why things are going the way they are. Uh, David Perron came out after the game and spoke, and and he was just kind of shaking his head and guy nobody knows you know Lalone is the same way he's like we're, we're trying to go through it we're trying to practice better and um you know you see some signs of oh this was better this was better but overall not good enough clearly yeah. not good enough and it's it's unacceptable you know one thing about the the trade deadline I wonder if we're going to look at this weeks down the road and say if the mistake of the trade deadline wasn't adding a forward or a defenseman was it not adding a goaltender yeah. and nothing against Alex Lyon but I mean, he's he had been inexperienced going into it, and there were there were questions about is it sustainable, and the name there were names brought up, goaltending names brought up, uh, veteran net miners that could have been had. That should the Red Wings have done that? I really hope we're not going to be second guessing things. I hope we're going to be talking about this team well, picking themselves up and 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 coming out of this and still making the playoffs. I hear you. I mean, Lyon is dealing with unprecedented volume in his career in terms of number of games he has played. Uh, he's also got some experience in the postseason. He started three games last year during Florida's run and in the postseason. So he's 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 played in big games. It's just the volume that's probably yeah, starting to build up on him a little bit here. I mean, he played a total of 18 games or something last year, whatever it was. Yeah. And but he's, he's, I guess he's the playing, point is he's I, playing four out of five nights here. It's not his first time in pressure situations. What it is, though, is his first time as a lead dog, and he's basically started more games this year than he has his entire career. It actually might be true. No, it is true. Yeah, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, DJ Reader signs with the Lions. I'm stoked. We'll get to that at 1035. 97 won the ticket. Hey, spring forward right now into truck season at Sarah Chevrolet Sterling Heights. Hurry in now because as the number one sh uh, volume Chevy dealer in Michigan, Sarah Chevrolet Sterling Heights has a huge inventory of trucks for the choosing, like the legendary Silverado or... If an SUV is more your style, Sarah Chevrolet Sterling Heights has all kinds of equinoxes for you to select from. Whatever you decide on, you can take it home today. Sarah Chevrolet Sterling Heights with a guarantee, with they guarantee rather the lowest price or it's free. 17 and a half in Van Dyke and Sterling Heights. Call 87 Say Sarah or go to saysarah.com. Together, let's drive.
Doug Carr, Scott Anderson. Good morning. Carson Anderson program reacting this morning to another Red Wing loss. Got a lion signing to get to. That's the good stuff. Well, I think it's the good stuff. Not everybody does. But let's get to your phone calls. We go to Jim. You're on 97 on the ticket. Hi, Jim. Dog, Gator, love you guys. Well, thank you. Um, just just a couple points, I guess. You know, everybody's talking about Larkin being out. Um, you know, Larkin's still still around, right? He he didn't go off on vacation, so you know, I I believe he's still got to be a voice in the locker room. So, I mean, I I really think there's some more to the story of what's going on. Um, so well, I would agree. You know, I would agree with that. I think Larkin being out is a big part of this, but this feels like it's bigger than Larkin being out. Yeah, and and you know, the whole trade deadline thing. I I, I know a lot of people want to read into it, but. You know, as as a player, like you go to your boss and say, "Hey, give us one more tool to be more efficient, right? Just give us one more." And then your boss tells you, "No," like that's got to be gut wrenching. I, I mean, wow. I, think, I think they're close. Obviously, not not a cup, but you know, when 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 something doesn't happen and you're kind of expecting it. Hold on, you hold know, on. I, I you're, you're, I, you're, I, you're making I, a big assumption. Yeah. You think you think Derek Lalone went to Steve Eisman and says you got to give me something, you got to give me something, and then they didn't do it. Maybe. Okay. I I I, I look. I'm with, I'm with you, but Jim, I don't I don't think Steve Eisman didn't try to do something. I I think Steve Eisman never got a deal that he thought would make the Red Wings better at the price that it would cost. Yeah, I, I, I guess that that's fair. I, yeah. I, I mean, you know, I, I don't think they're one player away. You know, for nothing to happen at all. Well, right? I mean, it goes back to <laughs> it's a gut we, punch. Yeah, we we don't know what trades that he came close to to pulling the trigger on. What the offers look like. I mean, I'm always leery of criticism at trade deadline time because you see, if you sat down and saw, okay, here were the four offers we had, you might go, oh, I wouldn't have made any of those deals either. A fourth line center for Simon Edmondson, no thanks. Role player, help a little bit on the penalty kill. For Marco Casper, no thanks. <laughs> you know? Right. So I I you know, your job is to try and negotiate better terms for you, but if you if a team said, Yeah, well, this is it, take it or leave it, he left it. I don't think there was him saying, I mean, I don't know this. But I find it hard to believe anybody in the Red Wings organization said we'd like to get better, and he said, Nope. <laughs> well, that's the thing. If you're going to make if you're going to make moves, you're only going to make moves to improve your team. And uh, you're not doing it just to, oh, let's let's swap out our third line guy for your third line guy. That's not what's happening, and and that's where it gets to be a difficult conversation to have. Two four eight five three nine ninety seven ninety seven. Robert, you're next. What's up, Robert? Good morning, gentlemen. How's everybody? Doing good. Hey, I'm doing great. I want to talk about the Lions, man. They made a heck of a move yesterday, man, by hiring. I am not saying this in a bad way. This was a straight compliment. They got Suge Knight, a.k.a. a goon, a game wrecker. Man, I love it, man. I love that pickup that they got from him. What you think? I like it a lot. I like it a lot. And I feel like that Brad Holmes up front defensively has built an effing wall. And I think when you can stop the run without committing extra guys to it and maybe put a little bit more emphasis on stopping the pass scheme-wise, I think you've created yourself some flexibility. I think they've gotten better in the secondary and better on the defensive line. Have they taken massive no. steps forward? No. But have they taken steps forward? Yes. I do want to see the final numbers on DJ Reader's contract because – the numbers out there seem like they might be inflated. Uh, two years and twenty six and a half million, or whatever it was reported. I think that might not be what it's actually about. Well, it's usually about the first year and how much they can put in that first year. Yeah. Yep. Right, right, right. I agree with you with that part right there. But the, the thing I just like, he's just such a game wrecker, man. Is a problem. He's a problem. Yes. And I, don't, I mean, I understand the injury of his quad and everything. That is a hard injury to come back from on all levels. But, man, if he could come back to his old self or even a quarter, well, 75 of his stuff. Man, we got something there. Well, I hope that that he is his old self. I'm counting on him being his old self, and I think there's no reason to believe he can't be his old self. Here's, 
I'm not sure I have, I don't have too much of an issue with it. All right. And the, the, the things that concern me a little bit is, is the contract. It's two years instead of one year. And the other thing is it's a player added to do one specific thing that you already did very well as a team last year. Lions were second in rushing yards given up per game last year. And they haven't really changed too much to the defense prior to adding DJ Reader. Did you need to add him? Or was would that resource of $13 million a season be better suited putting it elsewhere on the team? Um, and keep this in mind, too. One of the players, the, one of the reasons the Lions number was so high, only 88 yards a game, um, was Justin Fields, who's no longer going to be a problem in uh, on their schedule, you wouldn't think, Maybe. where he's going to rack up 150 yards a game uh, to inflate those numbers. So did the Lions need to go and get it? Or is, well, this, is this a smart idea to go ahead and continue to add to your strength? If you are getting a guy that is an elite run stuffer, and would also be better than anybody else they had last year, with the exception of Lee McNeil, I think is the number, at cr- pressuring the quarterback, you've gotten better. You've gotten better. And and that's where I'm, you know, ag- again, I feel like people wanted 1A+, plus, and what they've gotten is a bunch of BB minuses instead. But the defense last year was a D plus C minus. So you're you're definitely seeing steps forward, but you're not seeing this one massive move. Which, look, if that's what you wanted to do, then you know you, you'd, the the problem with the massive move is, is how it handcuffs you moving forward. There's a couple things about this signing that I love. First of all, listening to his news conference yesterday, um, you know, he said the recovery is coming along better than the first time he heard his quad. He's in good shape. He's he's uh, expects to be out there when practice starts. It feels like this guy has done his homework on Detroit. Like it, this wasn't just a, I'm going to the highest bidder. He he looked into what he was playing with, who he was playing against. He had intimate knowledge of Aline McNeil and Aiden Hutchinson. Uh, he's going to draw from his experience in Cincinnati when he was part of that team when they were when they were getting better and better. He was a team captain in Cincinnati, so duh, of course Campbell and Holmes were after him because they target those kinds those kinds of guys. But the rest of the story might lie in something that you've talked about a lot, Gator, and that is the new defensive line coach, Terrell Williams, who spent the last six seasons in Tennessee. Well, it just so happens that Tennessee has played DJ Reader in Cincinnati every single year that DJ Reader was in Cincinnati. And prior to that, DJ Reader was in Houston, and Terrell Williams faced him twice a season when he was the D-line coach with the te- or he was a D-line coach with the Titans and DJ Reader was a Texan and so they were in the same division they played each other twice he has seen him a ton and there's no way that Terrell Williams who is being billed as if not the best one of the best D-line coaches in the league didn't sign off on this move and has to have knowledge having seen him up close and personal having played him so much in recent years i think that if if we buy into Terrell Williams then it helps a lot to buy into this move. So I like it. I like it quite a bit. Now I am a little leery of the money. Seems like a little bit more. Yesterday I predicted he would sign in Detroit one year, six to six and a half to seven and a half million. And he got nine guaranteed. And the question is, can they get out of it if they need to quickly? Like if he gets hurt and never makes an impact. As far as the injury is concerned, I'm almost at a point, Gator, and I'm I'm emphasizing the word almost, but I'm starting to think you're either you've either been hurt or you're gonna get hurt. This is the NFL. Mm -hmm. Guys get hurt. And I'm looking at some of the other top signings around, and they're guys who gotten hurt (laughs) it with other teams. You you're taking calculated risks. One thing I like is that he came into Detroit and obviously I would think got the all clear from the Lions doctors. But you know, after last year, their two of their bigger signings got hurt. I can understand why people are worried, but I—I I mean, I—I I, I don't think you can be completely risk averse and get better. Yeah, I always get concerned when you hear a torn muscle and something like a quad is. Hmm. And if there was an option to get surgery and they chose not to, um, is—I mean, it's always 
you always ask yourself, is it the right thing? What makes you better in the, in the long term or whatever? Um, I'm a little concerned because he's torn both quads. That's another added concern. That being said, the player is really good. I mean, you can't you can't watch him play and not come away and say that guy that guy's a problem for a lot of offenses. Mm-hmm. Um, but could the money have been better spent for this Lions team? Like, would you rather see them spend it on a on a guard? Yeah, or would you rather say, you know, don't have Carlton Davis and DJ Reader, and instead have Kendall Fuller or Daniel yeah. Hunter? Yeah. The problem, the, the, like, all these talks about some of these bigger players, is you get into the long term contracts, most of them, that gets in way at the way of what appears to be a very important priority, and that's the resigns, the Amon Ra. Like, like if you say, yeah, I'd rather have Legarius Sneed, got it, but what if that made it extraordinarily difficult, if not impossible, to resign Amon Ra or Goff? Well, I get that. Yep. Um, I know you do. I yeah, use. Daniel Hunter's a two-year deal. Yep. So, but the second year is guaranteed at twenty-four million, which might be money that they have already essentially earmarked for Amon Ra. And nobody, I mean, I I can't imagine anybody wants to lose Amon Ra. No, uh, of course not. Or even toy with it. But then you get into can you restructure this or can you structure the contracts for the new players differently or it's not an issue? I think if they could, they probably would have gone bigger if they think they could they could finagle that. I don't know. It, it would make it a lot easier to get one of those big contracts. Yeah, but, I mean, the way Brad Holmes talks, that's not that's not his MO. Well, this is true. So I, I don't think it was ever really in the cards that they were going to go for someone like Daniil Hunter. Um, this seems to be much more in line with what they would do. It's not a $20 million a year contract. This could be up to 13 and a half or whatever it is um, for, a, for a really good player on the defensive line. I hope he does get pressure on the quarterback. I hope that's that's the case. I mean, he's not a guy because of his size who's going to run you down, but he's going to wreak havoc there and, and force a quarterback to go left to right. And if he forces him to go left to right, it might be right in the arms of Aiden Hutchinson or or James Houston or Marcus Davenport, or whomever is out there. I mean, that's he's a space eater, and you don't get past him in the run game, which is which is great. But that was the Lions' strength last year, stopping the run. Well, it's it's even stronger now. 248-539-9797. More of your phone calls and feedback coming up. It's Carson Anderson, 97.1, the ticket. So your house right now, think about this. You want it to be comfortable all year long, and maybe it, it, your your furnace has been acting kind of funny. You're concerned about your air conditioning unit, or even better yet, if you've got a problem with your, your water heater, how about this? Call the folks at Birmingham Plumbing, Heating, and Cooling. They know exactly what it takes to keep your home comfortable this, this year, and they're offering a deal where you can replace that clunky water heater, and you get a tankless one for free with the purchase of a Comfort Maker furnace and air conditioning package. Get it all done. They've got over 100 years of combined experience. They're the team that I trust. They absolutely know what they're doing. Visit them at BirminghamPlumbingCo.com. That's BirminghamPlumbingCo.com.
Doug Carr, Scott Anderson, 97 won the ticket. Open lines, 248. 539-9797. Back to your phone calls. Ryan's in a car and he's on 97.1. Hi, Ryan. Hey, guys. How's it going? Good. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to talk about the wings real quick. Um, and I, I, honest, I had a very genuine question for you guys. Yep. I mean, I look at the last seven games. Um, to me, it just looks like a very uninspired hockey team. And without your captain in the lineup, I'm just kind of waiting for someone to step up. And it's unfortunate that after the skirmish and practice, I feel like last night kind of told me everything I need to know about this team as far as their response. Another slow start. They don't get the first goal, whatever. Um, I, I'm genuinely curious with you guys. Five five years into a, a rebuild, so-called. Mm-hmm. And not even so much as far as the roster construction is concerned. But at what point are we allowed to demand more just in terms of the attitude that the organization has, because it feels like every time you hear Derek Lalonde or even Steve Eiserman talk in the media, it's this constant theme of, you know, well, we're overachieving, we have to trust the process, whatever. Like, when, when is enough enough and we can demand that? Like, why, why is this team not able to have the playoffs as being a forefront goal? It just seems like it's always on the back burner with these guys. I hear where you're coming from, and you know I kind of talked about it. If they don't make the playoffs now, I think we're looking at the first time that there's serious heat on the general manager, and justifiably so. And it'd be like, okay, got it. You've been drafting and loading up the organization, which gets high grades for how much talent they have in it, but there's two players that Steve Eisenman drafted that are really impacting this team right now. And... So, yeah, I think uh, that the sense of urgency gets cranked up, but this isn't the thing. I have no problem with a slow and steady build. like, And it's a lot easier now because we're close. You know, we're close to seeing this team make the playoffs and, and absolutely get better. And I still think that's still in the cards for this group. But, yeah, I I think that, you know, you have to see – you have to see some improvement next year if they if they don't make the playoffs and if they don't and you got to see some of these guys starting to impact the team like well, you know what you can't keep waiting they have i think it's four unrestricted free agents uh that are forwards that, that okay what do you do david perron is one patrick kane is another daniel sprong is an unrestricted free agent and uh so is uh, christian fisher i mean patrick kane's been great and if Patrick Kane decides he wants to get paid, he's going to get paid from somebody. And I, do you, if you're the Red Wings, do you step up and pay him, or do you just let him go because, hey, we got to find other options here for younger players and and start to bring this roster back to a, a younger, faster roster. I don't. I'm, I'm not sure what you do with Kane. The other guys, I can take or leave. You know, they've they've been nice players, but. They haven't taken this team to the level that you you really want them to go to, and I don't think that David Perron is a future player, or Daniel Sprong is a future guy, or Christian Fisher is somebody that I'm going to count on. I'd rather see those spots filled in by younger, hungrier players that have higher upside. And, and whether that comes from their own system or if they have to go out and find other free agents, they got to do it. Can I can I ask, can I ask you guys in in terms of roster construction and and maybe I'm sorry if I'm catching you off guard with this one. Would you guys trade rosters with Buffalo right now? As a team that's is a team that's young up and down. I mean the, the the Red Wings have the third oldest team in the league. Would you trade a roster with Buffalo that's got several players that Does are this in their include the minor leagues? 20s? Um Let's just look at the NHL roster, I would say, in, in terms of just, you know, they have Zach Benson's an 18-year-old rookie, and it, for as many guys as they have that are young that are playing in the lineup, yeah. I mean, how much better are the Red Wings than Buffalo yeah. right now? I mean, Seriously. Bu- Buffalo is better. I think Buffalo probably also has had better uh, draft they luck. They had better draft and, luck when it came uh, to the lottery. And a lot, sure, of, sure, a lot of the Red sure. Wing guys are, are – have yet to debut. Yeah. So and I was gonna say Buffalo has already started to launch that those all those young players are, are getting a lot of ice time right now. Mm-hmm. And the Red Wing players their prospects have yet to even, you know, crack the lineup. In fact, some of those guys haven't even seen North America because they're playing over in Sweden or wherever. Um but yeah, I mean it's it's all about the timing of of of, of when you think the rebuild is going in the right direction. 
And I get people are upset with this, and no, oh, you know, when when am I allowed? You're allowed to be upset anytime you want. Yep. I'm not going to tell you how you how you should feel. Um, I'm starting to lose patience a little bit as well. I want to see. I mean, it's it's the losing streak that's done it. Yeah. What's funny is, it, it's really hard to do right now, which is take a step back, take a thirty thousand foot view of this season, and go, okay, this team's way better than they've played. Their best player got hurt. It's impacted them negatively. The sad part is nobody has stepped up and and that the coach doesn't seem to have the answers and the general manager didn't make a move that made up for the loss of Larkin because he was hurt going into the trade deadline. So but, they, yeah. but he is coming back and we know they're capable of more. They're going to win another game, people. They're going to win again. They're not losing the rest of the way and they're going to win some games. It's just whether or not it's going to be enough to get in. The damage that this losing streak has done is not something you can't recover from. Keep that in mind. And we know they can play better. But I can't believe it's this relevant. Two weeks ago, I said they feel like they're never going to lose again. And now it feels like they're never going to win again. No, I know. Uh, Two weeks ago, I'm looking at the roster, and you're looking at guys like Perron and Sprong and Fisher, and you're saying, these are reasons why this team is playing as well as they are. they got veterans, adults in the room. These are guys who can usher in the, the younger crowd and – and they're leading by example. And now Larkin gets hurt. You're on a seven-game losing streak. And these are guys you'd be leaning on to get something done. And they're not getting it done. I get that Larkin's really important, obviously. <laughs> More so now than ever, right? Yep. But the loss of Larkin this big? I mean, one of the things Steve Eisman said after the trade deadline happened and went and passed was he likes the depth of this team. Shouldn't you be able to withstand a little bit of a loss? I mean, he's more than a little bit lost, but that's one player still. And Lalone, you've praised him, Gator, on this station. He's come out and said kind of what he would look for in a player before the trade deadline. Like, yeah, we could use this type of player. This, you know, this, we could use this, this, yeah. and that. They got nothing. Yep. Yep. Now, how hard did they try? Yeah, what, and I don't know what was yeah. on the table. What but deals I'm did they turn that, down? Yeah. It was, if you wanted a buy, it's disappointing that they did not get one. Two four eight five three nine ninety seven ninety seven. Feedback coming in from an unnamed texter. How does Derek Lalone still have a job? Gerard Gallon is currently unemployed. Eight and one and two losses to Arizona. Eight to one and two losses to Arizona. So Lalone here getting near the end of his second year. I don't think he'd be seriously under any jeopardy with as far as his employment unless there was a real disconnect between him and Eiserman. I think you're right. I mean, he was Eisen was patient with Blashill. He brought in Lalone, another one of his guys. Uh, I think he's gonna be patient with him. There is the connection with Gal- with Gallant and Eisman. They, yep. they were line mates playing here with the Red Wings back in the eighties. And um I also find it interesting the Gallant who was boy, was he the the hot name when he first came on the scenes was with with, with Vegas mm-hmm. and then was gone within a couple of years. I mean he's already been on, on a, a head coach for a couple teams. Um I'm not sure why that is, uh, but other teams are less. You wonder patient. if there's more to that story. Yeah, I don't know what what's going on there. I like Lalone. Um, I, I think he, I don't think he should be on the hot seat. I think that uh, the rest of this season has got you got a lot to play out, and I'm hoping we're not going to be severely disappointed when all is said and done. Tony from Warren writes in Doug Gator. It's totally the patch. And before you dismiss it, along with baseball, hockey players are very superstitious. They desecrated one of the best jerseys in all sports. All right. I mean, if you believe in these things, fine. How weak mentally would the team have to be if the patch is really impacting them? Really weak. Do you think that in the locker room, the topic of the patch comes up? I mean, maybe as a joke. But no, come on. This can't. Cannot and it it is it desecrate I mean, the, the uniform? I mean, you hardly notice it. It's there, but I mean, is it the Crash Davis line? You never f with a winning streak, and they put a patch on and they haven't won since. I'm seriously, like priorities advertisements are all over the games. They're up on the boards, the yeah, graphics, and it's just. And I'm just thinking to myself, if you're the CEO of Priority, yeah, but you're buying into it. No, I'm buying into it if I'm Priority. We're getting blamed for this. It doesn't matter. Since the first loss of this streak, people started blaming the patch. Now, is it a 
a very few people, I'm not buying into it having anything to do with anything. But if I was a CEO of Priority, I'd be like, well, now we are getting completely associated with this losing streak. Maybe we need to think of another way. There's more than one way to advertise. Unnamed texter, hey guys, I thought last night was going to be the beginning of a turnaround too, but it wasn't. And you can't tell me that they were trying to, weren't trying to play well. The team is listless and effortless, and I'm wondering what's going on in that locker room. Is it the coach? I honestly don't know. I've got an idea, something that I want to see from the team. Yep. And it's 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 a nod to the past, but it's not living in the past. I think it's something that, that could still have a role in today's hockey. All right, I'm going to give you a DJ Reader stat that might enthuse people that aren't enthused about the signing. We'll get to that coming up today at 11.08 here on Carson Anderson on 97.1 The Ticket. Brought to you by Capital Mortgage Funding. Conference tournament action abounds today and all weekend. Michigan State gets a rematch with Purdue at noon. Spartans lost close in West Lafayette two weeks ago. Zach Eady was dominant, though. 32 points and 11 rebounds. Will the result be any different today? Tom Izzo.
Purdue a seven and a half point favorite over MSU. The winner takes on the winner of Wisconsin and Northwestern tomorrow at noon. This just breaking in the NFL. The Vikings have acquired the Texans first round pick number 23 overall in what could be posturing to draft Kirk Cousins replacement at quarterback. Pistons host the Heat tonight. You can hear it here on 97.1 coverage starting at 635. We just got this, though. Asar Thompson and Quentin Grimes both out. Cade Cunningham questionable. And Michigan has hired a third-party firm to investigate the culture of its basketball program. This following allegations from former strength and conditioning coach John Sanderson, who claims head coach Juwan Howard tried to fight him during an altercation at practice. Sanderson also alleges Howard threatened violence against and, quote, manhandled his son and former U of M player Jet. In an email obtained by The Athletic, Sanderson's attorney told Michigan AD Ward Manuel there is a, quote, culture of fear and retaliation within U of M's basketball program. At the Corwell Health Update desk, I'm Beanie Howell. For more, go to 971 The Ticket or Odyssey.com. All right, so the wings here, a mess. Right now it's a mess. And it's, uh, what's the solution? You had an idea? Yeah, it's just an idea. I was thinking of like walking around the arena last night before the game started, and you see all these different jerseys that the fans are wearing. It's amazing to see how many different players are represented on the backs of jerseys. That, that fans want to I'm wear. I'm fascinated where you're going with this. And and then I watched uh, someone on the concourse walk over, and, and I'm like, is that? I think it is. It's Kirk Maltby walking over and taking pictures with some of the fans in the arena. And I started thinking, you know, the, the, the grind line was, they had a purpose, right? It wasn't just some kind of, oh, here's a cute thing. Like, those guys went out and they flew around the ice. And they created turnovers. And they made things prickly for the opposition. And they caused the other team to take stupid penalties. They put the Red Wings on the power play. Do they need to find their trio of players to just go out there and, and wreak havoc on the other team to be to be that grind line type guys? You don't I don't need to see them scoring, you know, have each guy be a a, a 30 or 40 point a, a season guy. But can they play a role? Can they find a line that just goes out there and plays a role? I mean, is it too late in the season to do that? Is it something? I'm just looking for an injection of something, and that's an injection of energy. And when they had it initially, Joe Koser was part of it. You know, then it was, of course, that the 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 the, the end result was Maltby, Draper, and, and McCarty. And those guys just brought it every single shift. Yeah. And it looks like the Red Wings don't have they don't have that energy right now. Can they find something? Can they find their inner grind line and put it out there? Is it something that you do you, you figure out next year? The other thing was just an injection of youth at some point, seeing younger guys get out there that are that are hungry and they want to play. When we saw Marco Casper play in the one game last year, he looked like he belonged. And his numbers haven't been spectacular. At, they haven't even been very good at Grand Rapids. You're like, well, how is he looks so good in the NHL? And yet it's not necessarily translating in the in the AHL. He's been better as of late, but still not there. But are they this close to having guys that they can put in the roster next year? You know, Nate Danielson's their first round pick from a year ago. It seems like he's gonna be a ways away, but at least he plays defense, right? That's his calling card. The, the Bedard said that that's the best player he ever played against defensively. And he's more than handles himself offensively. He's better than a point of game guy, uh, you know, with his junior team right now. I'm just thinking about the future of this team that they do have younger talent. And at some point it feels like there's going to be this massive wave of advisement drafted players. Well, there should be. Yeah. And, and is it going to happen sooner than later? Not it's, this it, year. I mean, <laughs> I don't two know. Separate things. Let, first, let me to your original idea. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I don't hate it. Um, and if anybody should know That's it, it should the be endorsement. Yeah, it should. <laughs> Steve Eisenman should know that. Right, Steve Eisenman should know how important a group like that could be, a grind line can be to a hockey team. He hasn't built it in the current incarnation of the Wings, and is it part of what's next with the Wings? I mean, is that where they believe Soderblom eventually ends up as you know, sort of a part of a, a group like that? So, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm no hockey coach, uh, 
But at the end of the day, it's an intriguing idea. But if that idea has merit, with all respect due to you, yeah. I'm sure Steve Eisenman had given sure. it some thought, right? Sure. And, I'm, just, and, I'm just sitting here as a fan trying to figure things out. And what are they missing? And they miss – really what they miss is energy. Mm-hmm. And I see no energy from this team. Well, not and now. No, not now. And and that was the one thing that stood out every night during, the, you know, for like a decade-long period was that you knew when that line came out that you had to have your head on a swivel, not because they were dirty, but just because that they were so high They're hard energy. to play against. They were they were really well, difficult. Isn't to that play what they said about Danielson? That he's one of yes. the reasons is because he's so hard to play against. Now he's not showing up here in the next thirty minutes. No, but he's nineteen years old and he hasn't. He's he's playing with his junior team. He's not even with the uh, with Grand Rapids. Well, yeah. I mean, I I'm not I'm not against that at all. Um, and I actually am a little surprised that hasn't been part of what Eisenman has built. When you think about it, I mean, maybe he thinks the game has changed so much that. Well, that's the guys, it's a, maybe it's a little surprising. And the guys around the team is they're just not constructed like that. You know, with your twelve forwards each night, are you looking at? Can you find a three that that provide that? I mean, it seems like everybody they've got a couple guys on this team that can maybe be higher end goal scorers, and not even higher end is the wrong way to put it because they've all these guys have ten goals, and they have like two or three players that have twenty. And and right the way they're going right now is anybody threatening for thirty, you know, with sixteen games left or whatever it is. All right, feedback coming in. The thirty thousand foot view of this team is Steve Eisenman hasn't done enough in five years to make this team relevant. That's the bottom line. Dancing around it doesn't help anyone. That's from Dan in Sterling Heights. Well, I did the thirty thousand foot view of the season. The thirty thousand foot view of Steve Eisenman's tenure in Detroit has been. Slow and steady improvement. No big jumps forward, but kind of a, a feeling like this should be a playoff team. And if it's not, that's where they've they, they've detoured. You know. Well, and if you're if you're demanding the oh five years in the rebuild, all this understand the team he took over was horrific, uh, totally devoid of talent. Um, but they're save, for, save for a couple players, yeah. But in in five years, he's trying to. I guess he's trying to build it through the draft. They had some contracts they had to work out early on. And and then the last couple of years has been when he's added free agents, veteran free agents to the mix. But there, there's only a, there, there's a cap on the talent of the, of the free agents that he's brought in. And at some point you're expecting, maybe they expected the, the younger players to develop a lot quicker than they have. Well, then that might be a bit of a miscalculation. Then that could yeah. be. Uh, next one, Doug, why is Steve Eisenman above criticism for you? Did he did just throw it out there that Steve might not have made a trade deadline deal because he knew this team wasn't good enough to make a run is ridiculous. Is there any other excuses you can come up with before you're willing to criticize the captain? I'll start with this. I'll criticize Steve Eisenman when I'm damn well ready to, okay? I'll do it when I want to, not when you want me to. But I've also laid out when that time will come. I Literally earlier this show, I said, if they don't make the playoffs, this time next year, if the situation hasn't changed, that's a major problem. And if they don't make the playoffs, for the first time, there is legitimate heat on Steve Eisenman, in my opinion. So but that's a year from now. Well, no, I said if they don't make the playoffs this year, this there's year, legitimate okay. heat. If, there's no, if they're not in the playoffs, if they're in the same situation next year, then you, you really— about y- finding somebody else. Yeah. So, again, that's exactly when. <laughs> um, if you did, So, to answer your question, that's when I'll criticize. Uh, Stevie, uh, Stevie's unwillingness to invest sends a clear message to the team. I imagine it's a little deflating. Well, but what were you going to do? What was the move to be had that you think would have been the what one he, that, what that gets down? this team? And, and uh, Yeah, exactly. Uh, not losing seven in a row. What was the move that, that should have been made by last Friday? Uh, yeah, I mean, what move? I, <laughs> we do this every year at trade deadlines when our teams are decent, and that is when you don't make the big move, people are critical of it. I'm like, <laughs> like you, you can only do so much in terms of letting the public know what was on the table and what wasn't. And we, we did it with Brad Holmes. There were times where we did it with the Tigers and Dombrowski. And people are like, I can't believe they didn't do this. I can't believe they didn't do that. Didn't was that trade available? Do you know what the price tag was? Because maybe you wouldn't have made that deal if you knew what the price tag was. Like I, I get the frustration, 
but when you when you have to be held accountable and you go face the people that you're critical of and they tell you what they had, it's a little different. They didn't just idiotically turn down great trades. 248-539-9797. Ariel, you're next on 97. Want to take it? Hello, Ariel. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Um, I think the loss of Dale Larkin really shows the lack of depth in this team and that and I believe that goes to the GM, who is Steve Eisman. Um, I'm not ready to criticize him yet, but I do think that he needs to, even if they make the playoffs, they need to get more depth on it, on this team. And um, since, you cover, since you cover Michigan football, Doug, I just want to say I believe the next quarterback is on this team, and they're not going to have to go to the transfer portal. And I think um, I don't think it's rebuilding year. I think they're going to reload. That's all. Who do you think the quarterback yeah, is? <laughs> I believe it's going to be between Denegal and Orgy. Okay. And, because, and I would not be surprised if Orgy gets that role because because I think I think he's going to have a, a great spring. That's all. He seems like he has a leg up. I, you know, we'll see. Um, it's funny. Point spreads came out yesterday on FanDuel for some of the bigger games. And I'm looking at Michigan point spreads and I'm like, I don't even know who's going to be on the roster. Like it's do you do that? it's so difficult. Uh, but if Alex Orgy is the choice, um, it'll be a different style. He's he's a little bit more run guy than JJ was. JJ could run, and they did run him. But I think Orgy would run a lot. Um, so a lot of people would get their wish. I know people love mobile quarterbacks, but doesn't have the experience. Yeah, the accuracy. The, right. Yeah. A lot of those He's got arm up. strength. 248 539 97. We'll get to more of your phone calls and feedback coming up. Hey, FanDuel's putting the ball in your court the rest of the NBA season because right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks if your bet wins. So find a heavy favorite. Put the 5 bucks down on them. Boom. You get your $200 in bonus bets. Bet on the NBA with a wide range of bet types. That includes quick bets, live same game parlays, player props, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash Doug and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel is the official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Must be 21 or over and present in Michigan. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit is required. Bonus issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. <clears throat> See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problems? Call 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help.
Okay. Uh, didn't get a chance to get to this because people wanted to talk, have phone calls and feedback. So let me follow through on the DJ Reader stat. I keep talking about people. If you want a home run, fine. I, I, I get that that feeling of they should have gone big with LeJarius Sneed or they should have gone big with Daniel Hunter. But the one thing about DJ Reader and the DJ Reader signing, it's well established that he is a great run stuffer. Like, that's what he is known as. But what if I told you that last year he would have led the Lions in QB pressures from the defensive tackle spot? Out of their defensive tackles, he would have had the most QB pressures. And he didn't play a full season. So you talk about, are you getting better as a team? Will this guy help? Last year, Lee McNeil had 20 QB pressures. DJ Reader had 22. Benito Jones, I believe, was next with 13. So if you are just, are you getting better? Is it as much as you'd like? Well, that can be debated. And I understand that debate. And if you wish the money went elsewhere, got it. But as much as he is a run stuffer, he can also provide more pass rush from that spot. Maybe not elite, but more pass rush from that spot. So maybe that will help some people that aren't sold on this. Maybe. Maybe. Um, I mean, certainly it's it's nice to hear that there's more pressure Mm -hmm. uh, coming from the middle. I don't know if that was, was that year an outlier year for him? What, how he's been year to year? With his with the pressures, I don't know. Um, but the Lions, they obviously weren't getting a ton of pressure from the middle. They're getting all the pressure from the edges. Uh, McNeil gave him some pressure. Yep. Um, and McNeil's known as a run stuffer as well. I mean, it, yeah, it's but not, he also slimmed down because he wanted to become more of a of a, of a yes. pass rushing threat. best shape of his life. Well, he was, <laughs> but he did. He actually had shed some weight and got there. And you know, Reader is a Reader's a beast. He is, he's, you know, what you're getting with him, which is, it's good. But what the Lions did was add to the strength of the team, which was stopping the run. That, that was the strength of the defense last year, second in the NFL, and less than 90 yards given up per game. And they just added to that by getting a really good run stuff. Was yeah, it the right move? Uh, it's, it, it's a move that makes them, it makes them better. And, you know, they've, I, I, at this point, right? This free agency approach, okay? You tell me if you agree. They've improved the secondary. Yeah. They've improved the D-line. Yeah. They've weakened the O-line. Yeah. And they desperately need a starting, a good starting guard, another edge rusher, and a third wide receiver. Uh, yeah, most of that. I might, do they desperately need a, another edge rusher? They might have it. No, I said they desperately need a starting guard, and they need a, a, a third wide receiver, and an, and I still would like to see them add to the edge rusher. And I, to be honest with you, it's probably a draft pick at this point. Now, they don't go into the draft saying we want this position, but <laughs> I would like to uh, I would like to see them do that. Well, I think they have flexibility with what they need to go with in the draft, and find their best player available and they'll find that best player available. I'm not sure what, what needs to be done in free agency the rest of the way, other than I'd, I'd, I'd feel better if they added another guard to the mix. Yeah. They are in a, they're in a position right now. Unless there is true belief in some sort of Oasika sores thing who are, you know, in the last couple of years, players that they've acquired draft and otherwise that they can, they can, those guys can get the job done at a high level and the offensive line can still play with them. This has become the most critical component of the offseason to me is either trade, sign, or draft somebody that can play that position at a high level. Because everything offensively starts with that foundation. So that's where I'm at. Yeah. Um, are you concerned at all with Reader that, I mean, the effectiveness can be taken away if – and maybe this is another reason. I mean, you have to look at do a real deep dive into why the Lions' rush defense was so good. Was it so good because teams just didn't run because they thought we can tear up that they're secondary? 
And does that kind of, I, I mean, I know you bring it up, the, the pressure stat, maybe this is where he his true impact is going to be felt because if teams aren't going to run against him, then he's going to have to be a, a better pass rushing threat than what we've seen. And on paper, he is. Well, there's a reason why I'm big on yards per carry and not total yards. I think yards per carry is a, a greater indicator of how good or bad your defense is, and they had a pretty damn good yards per carry total last year, and I can't find it, but I remember we did this late in the year for this very reason, uh, was to talk about their defensive yards per carry. And it it's a it's a good it's a good total. Um but I'm not finding it right now, so give me one moment. But I yeah, it's it, there are stenu- extenuating circumstances that um, that can change, you know, how you feel about a, a team where, where the statistics are misleading. I yes. think their yards per carry stat was pretty damn good. Yeah, and and again, the other thing I go back to is that one of the the guys that totally wrecked that stat would have been Justin Fields, and if he's not going to be the quarterback of the Bears, which it doesn't look like he's the quarterback of the Bears anymore, that you've you've even improved that stat. Yep. Lions yards per carry last year allowed 3.7, third best in the NFL. 248-539-9797. Let's get back to your open line calls. Ed is next here on 97 One the Ticket. Hello, Ed. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my call. I wanted to say something about the Red Wings. Um, We know what the Red Wings can do uh, before they win on that seven-game skid. They're being outworked. It has nothing to do with what's happening with Stevie or he's not getting the right gas. They've got some inner, in, in, they've got turmoil in their locker room and the younger guys are not seeing enough from the older guys. <laughs> They're trying to hold them accountable. That's what it looks like to me. So if they come to work and go to work, they can play with anybody, but if they make excuses, uh, nobody can help them. Well, it's a pretty veteran roster. I was going to say, I don't yeah. know how many young guys there are outside, you know, in the forward lines, except for well, last Raymond night and, there was a few, but uh, but or as Raymond far as, and Rasmussen, yeah, but how old's uh, Zarnik? Um, but and you know, as far as I don't, I haven't heard them make excuses. Excuses, well, it depends on what your definition of excuses is. I know. I feel like some people, any reason you give up other than they suck is an excuse. Um, I've noticed that over the years. But for me, an excuse is something that has nothing to do with anything. Like, for instance, I, I will say, I don't think this is all Dylan Larkin's injury. Dylan Larkin shouldn't lead to them looking like they can play with anybody, looking like they can play with nobody. Unless we have completely and totally wildly underrated Dylan Larkin. <laughs> Two four eight five three nine ninety seven ninety seven. 539 Something is trending in a very good direction for this Detroit team. We will get to that today at 1134. It's Carson Anderson, 97 won the ticket. Fandle's putting the ball in your court for the rest of the NBA season because right now new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. It's $200 if your bet wins. Bet on the NBA with a wide range of betting options that include quick bets, live same game parlays, player props, and more. That's Fandle.com slash Doug to make your first bet a layup. FanDuel.com slash Doug. That's $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. So go to the money line, find a heavy favorite, put your $5 there, and get your $200 in bonus bets. FanDuel is the official sportsbook partner of the National Basketball Association. Must be 21 or older and present in Michigan. First online real money wager only. $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued is now withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problems? Call 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help.
I'm a little surprised we wake up this morning and no announcements regarding Jackson Job and the Tigers organization. Apparently he's still at this time. We no schedule to pitch, nothing. Okay. It's only a matter of time, right, Gator? By time, if you mean sometime in the next two seasons, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'd love to see him. I hope that uh hope he tears it up in the minors this year. Yeah. And that he you have to bring him up. Um, but at the same time, I kind of hope they don't. Because I hope they can tear it up in the minors, but the, the Tigers pitching has been so strong well, that it's that's not going to happen. Thing. And, and that's the thing I mentioned before the break, really trending in a good direction. Another good day yesterday. Uh, another shutout for the entire staff. Casey Mize gives him four strong innings. I mean, the, the, if you're asking me mm-hmm. in my entire life, in my entire life, but in my adult in recent years, <laughs> wow, really? Well, the I mean, now. I go back to when it, when I, dude, when Dave Dombrowski was was drafting, and I'm like, horde pitching, horde pitching, horde pitching. It's spring training, so all they have done is pique my interest as to what this staff is going to look like in the regular season. I'm getting more and more encouraged that some of their young arms might be blossoming, and what I'm talking about is Scooble obviously has blossomed. Mm-hmm. He's a legit Cy Young candidate. Then you got Mize, Manning, and Reese Olsen. The way my eight is pitching, somebody might get squeezed out. If only we could think of who that would be. But even that guy pitched well the other day. And now you've got Jackson Job, who who had a um, – I think some people are overhyping that appearance. Some people? Yep, but I'm not. Are they, I'm people, giving it the appropriate amount yeah, of attention. Some people that sit across from yours truly. Uh, which well, that is would, you. No, no, because that would be implied that it's me. Yeah. And I'm giving it the approach, appropriate amount of attention. Well, it's nice to see that high draft picks uh, that were pitchers for the Tigers organization, whether it's Mize, Manning, to a degree, even Fiedel and Brisky are still competing. And you go back, it's not that long ago, but it, it, well, it kind of is now as we're getting further and further away. But the, the Kenny Baas of the world, Matt Wheatland, Kyle Sleek. Sleeth. Sleeth. Yeah, Sleeth. It was Sleeth. Right. Sleeth. Uh, but those guys that never made it, never panned out. Mm-hmm. Uh, who's the guy that's the uh, investor now? Justin, was it? Justin Turner. Yeah. Jacob. Jacob Turner. Jacob Turner. Thank you. Yep. Uh, the, he didn't pan out. I mean, they had He's always... a great follow on Twitter, by the way. Is he not? Yeah, Justin or Jacob. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, he is. He does financial advice now, and and he relates it to wh- when he was a player. So it is. It's, it's, a good it's actually yeah. ex- incredibly interesting. So it's nice to see that their recent foray into spending high draft capital that these guys are still competing because those guys never really even did anything at the major league level. These mm-hmm. guys, in looking at the lower end of it, of, of Fiedo and Brisky, they're still fighting for it. And Fiedo has shown signs that he can still pitch uh, and 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 maybe has a, a some kind of niche in, in Major League Baseball. But it's Mize that you're really counting on. I mean, Mize is 1-1. You've got to be – you got to hit on the 1-1, right? Yes. And it looks like he's turning things around if he can stay healthy. He's having an encouraging spring. Yes. he's And the, particularly last night was really nice to see. I hope he can continue to pitch well and stay injury-free. And if that's the case, then they've got something there. People talk about – Matt Manning's got a different attitude. He's got an edge to him and all this. Great. Okay. Wait, he's got a different attitude? Well, that's what people are saying that he's he's got this edge to him and he just Matt Manning's got an edge? Yeah. Awesome. I didn't realize he had an edge. Yeah, he's got an edge. You know, a little different. He's made differently. His makeup is different. His constitution <laughs> is different. He's ready to ready to advance this year. Maybe this is the year that he steps forward. He's different. There's something about him. I knew he was pitching better. I didn't realize he had an edge to yeah, him. Yeah, he's an edge. All right. Well. He's different. Uh, <laughs> he's got an edge, people. He's got an edge. You you doubting this? Um, no, no, I'm not. 
Does this mean he's like looks mean? He's mean mugging batters. Mean mugging. <laughs> you know what's this is so funny. I'm looking at the, the, the spring training stats. Matt Manning has thrown eight innings. Yep. But he's only given up four hits, Doug. Of course, he's given up f- all four of those hits, by the way, have been home runs. Really? <laughs> yeah. He pitched four oh, hits. Home runs and three walks in addition to that. He struck out 11 in the eight innings. What's uh, Casey Mize at? Casey Mize has pitched 10 and two-thirds innings, and? given up eight hits, four and runs, no home runs, seven walks. That's a that's a lofty number. He had a bad ten strikeouts. Yeah. Yes, he and did. And by the way, say it correctly. Say it the way. Uh, Casey Buck- Mize. <laughs> Turn the last name Mize into a four syllable name. It feels like the entire pitching staff of the Tigers started the spring with an awful start mm-hmm. and they've all corrected since then, but the numbers still don't look good because of that awful start. What's RO? Uh Reese Olson, ten innings, ten and two thirds innings, mm-hmm. nine hits, mm-hmm. five earned runs, ten strikeouts. But again, it's a guy who had a terrible outing and has made up since then. Yep. I'm liking it. My eight has been good. Nine innings, two earned runs. I uh, like it. Your boy Jack Flaherty. Needs an edge. He doesn't have the edge like Manning does. No. Manning's got an edge. Yeah, money. Yeah. Anyway. I actually, you know what? I mean, Manning's an imposing figure. He is six six and he's He's athletic. Yeah, he's not. Very athletic. He doesn't look uh He'll intimidate you now. He can stay healthy. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, he intimidate because he's got that edge. He's got an edge. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have a feeling young young Gator Anderson was saying a lot of the same things about those other players that never made it here. Uh, you know, no, I Kenny Ball. Kenny Ball. And, he's got and an Cal edge. Sleeth and never got a chance to see those guys play. Did you see uh, Cameron Mabin's chicken wing? Man, that thing looks. That he's is, round that, and base. We, we definitely yeah. saw the chicken wing. <laughs> it just looks. Uh, yeah. He's got an how, edge. How is he so fast with that with that arm that was just nowhere Wailing near where he should have been? I don't know. Anyway, inside of two weeks to opening day. LFG. LFG. All right, so I'm happy with the pitching. Happy with the pitching. And that's not even including my boy, JJ. Right. Bo Brisky, seven and two-thirds innings. Yeah. You know how many hits he's given up? Uh, Four and a third. None. <laughs> four and a third hits. <laughs> yeah. No hits in seven and two-thirds innings. So he's working on a spring training no hitter. That's multi, what he's doing. Multi appearance. That's no-hitter. exactly what he's doing. He's been great. All right. Uh, Michigan State plays at noon against Purdue. Here's my question: If you are Purdue, and I'm saying this in all seriousness, all right, are you considering an element of load management after what happened last <laughs> year when they were a one seed and got knocked off by 16 seeded Fairleigh Dickinson University? Uh, no, you're not. No, because this is. This is every every big team that has a chance to win the national championship. Yep, is doing the same thing. They are they're they're trying to win their conference tournament. Yeah, um, you know I remember one year Duke won a regional, and they brought the ladders out, and Duke was like, "We're not cutting down nets because that's not our goal to get to the final four. And I'm just wondering if Purdue would say winning the Big Ten tournament is not our goal, so we're not going to go overboard trying to win it. I, it, I I'll be honest. I'm co-opting a theory from Evan, who is wondering if Zach Eady's minutes will be down today. Yeah, I can't imagine that's the case. Okay, because this is their first game of the tournament. I know. So I don't think they're going to. I mean, do you make a case? I, I don't even think you make a case for it. You're trying to win. You're trying to keep it going, and and because there's the, there's the case that can be made that oh, if you lose, you had too much time off, right? Yeah. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Well, here's what you damn well can't do is lose in the first round of March Madness again. No, you can't. And the other thing is Michigan State played Purdue pretty tough last time. Um, You know, if Purdue wants to take them lightly and and exit, then go ahead. I think Michigan State's probably going to come up with maybe their best punch. I don't know if it's going to be strong enough. Dude, they got a punch. Michigan State in a game will punch you at least once. But they don't. They, they yeah. don't punch you twice, right. <laughs> unless it's a knockout blow. Mm-hmm. Two four eight five three nine ninety seven ninety seven. We had a trade in the NFL. Another team loading up on first round picks. We'll get to that in the noon hour.
Straight ahead, a store is closing, Gator. Will this impact you in any way? We will get to that at 1146. It's Carson Anderson, 97 won the ticket. Well, if you're looking for a great place to watch any game, the best place in town is 24 Seconds Bar and Grill in Berkeley. They've got amazing food and a great staff that works there as well. And if you want the best wings in town, head out to 24. St. Patrick's Day plans, 24 seconds. You can avoid the crowds and get great specials they have there. $5 uh, drafts of Guinness, $3 green beers. They've got corned beef and cabbage. And we got the Big Ten tournament going on this weekend and for the college basketball tournament as well. Check out 24. All the seats are great. There's flat screen high definitions all throughout the place. They have amazing specials during basketball as well. And uh, you're going to want to check out the specials and everything else they got going there. Their website at 24secondsbar.com. And uh, they're now open for lunch on Thursdays and Fridays. Plus, the specials they have. $3 $3 margaritas on Wednesdays. They got $3 Long Islands on Thursdays. They got trivia on Thursday nights as well. Specials during Detroit hockey and Detroit basketball games. Check it all out. Uh, you're also going to want to make sure that you look at their Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram pages for great contests they have. And if you want any party or event catered, let 24 seconds do all the work. Like I said, every seat is a great seat. It's my favorite place to go. Uh, the service is great. The food's even better. And you're going to want to check them out. Grab a taste of the action for yourself. 24 seconds bar and grill on 12 mile in Berkeley.
So I'm just going to bring something up that I'm not sure it was any worse last night than any previous Red Wing game all season long. I'm not sure. And maybe I was just in a particularly sensitive place. I'm a little short with people because of the, how poorly they're playing Gator. Uh, or maybe it actually was worse last night. Pound the glass guy. Pound the glass guy was way out of control last night. And I don't know if anybody else noticed it, but it felt to me like pound the glass guy was out of control. Out of control. Nobody likes pound the glass guy. Uh, pound the glass guy is annoying as hell. Yep. I did not notice pound the glass guy. Right. Well, you were at the game. Yes. So when when the mics pick up Pound the Glass guy, yeah. I felt like there was a lot of the front row reserved for Pound the Glass guy last night. Well, it's hard to reserve anything other than the front row for Pound the Glass exactly. guy. Exactly, but I think more Pound the Glass guys showed up last night. There were more Pound the Glass guys than I remember there being all year. So maybe it was just me. Maybe I'm in a bad place with this team, so everything irritates me. But I was ready. Perfectly thought it was acceptable if Pound the Glass guy got ejected, which aren't grounds for ejection usually. Uh, okay. So news that uh, Dollar Tree is closing a thousand stores, including some family dollar stores. Uh, I got sent to the dollar store last week by the wife, who wanted something very specific from the dollar store. Now, do you shop? Often at the dollar store? No. No. Okay. Kang, do you shop often at the dollar store? More. My wife does more than I, I ever thought. Yeah. 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 It's for particular things. Okay. Like, for instance, for what? Because I feel like- Things the, you can get for a dollar. <laughs> actually, you can't. A lot of them now, they it's make an announcement. It's $1.25 yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. It's $1.50. Yeah. Uh, they have to make an announcement. Uh, I noticed my trips into the dollar store. Almost, almost a dollar store. Yeah. <laughs> Used to be a dollar store. Used to be a dollar store. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, what are the specific things she goes after? One, because we have two young daughters that love to do puzzles. They yep. have a lot of uh, variety of dollar puzzles. Okay. So that's actually really good for uh, the dollar store. Is great for that for yep. my kids. Yep. That's one. Okay. And the other thing that we tend to go to, this is for a very specific reason, is for cards, greeting cards. Graduation cards, birthday cards, uh, How's bar mitzvah, selection? selection good, Mother's Day. It's not bad. You know they have a whole Bit of section. A mixed bag it. though, isn't it? Yes, it's definitely. Hey, you're not. It's a dollar. <laughs> you know, right, right. right. No, because, because, because greeting cards have gotten, or by the birthday cards or whatever, they've gotten expensive. Tell the story, Kang. Tell the story. Oh. <laughs> well, we we're running late for a graduation party. I think it was uh, last summer or the summer before, mm -hmm. and we needed. <laughs> Uh, a card. We're just going to give money, right? I'm like, oh, you have a card? You have... No, no, let's just stop at the dollar store like we always do. Got it. This is in the <laughs> middle of summer, right? So I didn't realize this, of course. There are a ton of graduation parties going on, and this was like a Saturday. So I go into the dollar store. I go to the gra graduation card section, and the only graduation card left is a very religious graduation <laughs> card. <laughs> so good. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, I'm not even sure what religion this kid is. <laughs> right. And if he's religious at all. Blessed for I, you yeah, is the opportunity yeah, right. to matriculate. Like, and I'm like, do I take the chance? <laughs> <laughs> you might just look at the money. Who cares, right? Yeah, right. Does he really care yeah. what the card says? Probably kids, not. Kids don't care about the card. No, they care about putting, what's inside the card. But the parents look at the cards. and the yeah. parents like, What the hell is this? What the hell? <laughs> We're Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> right. I hope we got some cash. <laughs> So, yeah, that, that can go wrong. But, yeah, that's what I go in there for, cards and uh, apparently puzzles. Uh, okay, so I got sent there when my wife wanted cleaning stuff. Like, okay. Like some sure. sort of cleaning stuff for her classroom. So, go to the dollar store. You know, it's a school. You probably need more mass in terms of product than the elite <laughs> cleaning stuff. But, yeah, the dollar store is good for certain things. And so, I don't like... I don't like seeing this. And there were, by the way, when I'm... If only there were other options. 
What do you mean? Well, there's like Dollar General. There's like five different kinds of dollar okay, stores. Well, fair enough. Yeah. But uh, I mean, the one near us is closing, but we'll have to drive a little. We'll probably spend more dollars on gas yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to go get to the dollar store. No, but I get There are things that you can get there, like uh, seasonal type stuff. Or, yeah. Like all you've the got time. a party, mm-hmm. you want napkins, something like yep. that. And, and, and St. Patrick's Day is coming up, right? I yeah. bet you people are going there looking for decorations sure, or napkins. Right? And, Makes it real easy. Yep. Yeah. Nobody at a party ever goes, boy, the quality of these napkins really lacking. I'm not enjoying this party. Uh, all right, so what? Let's take ten texts. With news today, the Dollar Tree is closing a thousand stores, including some family dollar stores. What is the best thing to get at the dollar store? What do you use the dollar store for? We'll take ten texts. Remember to sign your text. First ten we get, can go uh, send them over to us. And we'll get to what people are saying the best thing to use. Best thing to use the dollar store for. We just got this ticket text, and he signed it. Thank you, John, from Lake Orion. Yeah. Business plan, move fast AF into former Dollar Tree family dollar locations. Oh. Take advantage of the cheap lease. I like it. Fast <laughs> AF being Kang's idea for a grocery store, but you got to keep moving. Yeah. You might, have to keep moving. Yeah. This might not be big enough, but maybe we start out small Yeah. and see how this, this thing grows. Like start with a convenient AF? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if, you sell, like if you sell lottery tickets convenient AF, you know what you're not allowed to do? Fill out your Yeah, numbers. no pick no, numbers. No, that's no, not no. even an option. Easy, it's no, easy can't. pick all the way, dude. Yep. It's a totally separate window. If you want to fill it out, you go somewhere else. Yeah. Not up in here. Not up in here. Not up in here. 248-539-9797. Let's get back to your open line calls. Glenn is next on 97 Want a Ticket. Hello, Glenn. Hi, guys. Yes, I did notice that also, with that Red Wing fan, he was pounding on the glass in the first row seat. Now, I've never been a season ticket holder, but I have laid out major bucks to get ringside seats, okay? But you don't want to be that guy who pounds on the glass. And it seemed like that guy was trying to inspire Kaner or something. I don't know, but it's just very creepy. And you should have more class than that. Like, show, you know, act like you've been there before. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, look, I don't know if it's creepy, and I don't know if it's lack of class. It just was annoying as hell to me last night. I could not get over, and it was more than one guy. There was one guy in particular behind the goal to the right, and it was all his crew, but there were people along the sideboards, and it just felt like pound the glass guy last night. I'm like, all right, got it. Hey, you're in the front row. Got it. Well, it's annoying. Is it, does yeah, anybody like pound like, the glass guy? Does anybody go, you know what, the game kind of sucked, but at least pound the glass guy really made a strong showing? I mean, I've got a cousin who's a professional hockey player, and I I'm got right. seats right behind the glass for him, but I didn't pound the glass and shout out his name like, yeah, man, go get him. No, it's it's, it's just classless. Act like you've been there Act like this isn't your first hockey game or your first beer. Well, but it probably was. Yeah, it might have been his first time sitting lot, there. I gotta tell you, I feel like I think the high percentage of people that sit in those seats that get the, the, the pound in the glass that it might be the first time sitting in those seats, and they feel like they're obligated to pound the glass. Mm-hmm. I think you're right, and it is annoying. It's hard not to do once, though. I mean, if you're sitting there, it's like walking in down Home Depot and seeing a bag of mulch and not slapping that bag of mulch. Well, that is tough. <laughs> I admit, right. yeah. Slapping it back. That you is know, tough. You're like, you never just like tapped it? Come on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Doug, you no, know I'm what I'm done. Yeah, about. I know exactly. You're slapping it, you're tapping it. Why do I what do that? Do? Why <laughs> the hell do I do that? It's a good bag of mulch. That's good mulch. <laughs> That's good mulch. That's good yeah. mulch. <laughs> Darker the better. Yeah. That's mulch. Is like that solid, bag of mulch. Solid mulch. <laughs> this is impressive mulch. Not too peaty. Now, pound the glass guy. I think it would be easy to resist. You think so? Oh, yes. We should all get seats there. The three of us, first one to pound the glass, like buys dinner or something. Well, it won't be me. Yeah, I won't all be. Right. Yeah. Can you want to buy us dinner? <laughs> <laughs> I, had, uh, I had seats there last year. Took my nephew, my brother, and my niece's boyfriend, and uh, we all had seats along the glass by the, uh, behind the, one of the nets. And none of us did, thankfully. I did have to instruct my nephew not to put his, his soft drink 
on the dasher. Said, That's Take cool. it away right now. He goes, why? He said, trust me. You'll see in a second. And sure enough, he was he was witness to somebody who did not remove it, and and you saw why. But he hits a glass that yes. drinks coming into your lap. That's what we call karma to the pound of glass people. It's like I don't even. I, wanna, I, will, I will tell my nephew, but I'm not going to tell anybody else because if, if this jackass over here is going to start pounding the glass, wow. I hope that they put their beverage there. All right, two four eight five three nine ninety seven ninety seven. Interesting update from practice. We'll get to that today at twelve oh two and trade. In the NFL, somebody's fattening up on draft picks. What are they doing? We'll get to that in the noon hour as well here on 97.1 The Ticket. Brought to you by Northville Lumber. Meet the Lions' latest free agent acquisition, DJ Reader, a six foot three, three hundred thirty five pound run stuffing D tackle who sounds like a perfect fit. Lions inked Reader to a two-year deal for $27 million and more than $9 million guaranteed. Keeping tabs on Detroit's NFC North contemporaries, the Vikings now have two first-round picks, 11th and 23rd overall, after trading for Houston's today. And Chicago acquired Keenan Allen from the Chargers for a fourth-round pick. Pistons have a chance tonight to extend their winning streak to three, which would be a first in over two years, with Miami in town. They'll have to do it without Asar Thompson and Quentin Grimes, though, who've both been ruled out already with illness. Cade Cunningham officially questionable. And Michigan State has already effectively pushed its NCAA tournament streak to 26 by way of yesterday's win over Minnesota. But MSU would still like to get a W over Purdue. Spartans and Boilermakers about to get underway in the Big Ten tourney. Purdue, a seven and a half point favorite. At the Corwell Health Update Desk, I'm Beanie Howell. For more, go to 97.1 The Ticket or odyssey.com.
Keep seeing these headlines with stories about Bronny James and declaring for the draft and all this. No. <laughs> what was it was he did i miss the memo where he had like a really good season at usc where he should declare for the draft Dude, or is this just this is totally, not how you know how this works now it's just dad driven no it's you don't need to have a good season to declare you're taking on potential if they, people think you have potential is there potential take. did he show potential uh if your last name is james and you might be able to get dad as well there's your potential. I suppose that's it, right? Mm, quite possibly. Uh, okay. Here are the 10 texts. We asked people, what are the best things to get from the dollar store? That with news, unfortunately, that 1,000 stores are closing in the Dollar Tree family, dollar family. Uh, Alex at St. Clair Shore says, kids' toys for a road trip, dollar store. Adam and Bloomfield, kitchen utensils. Paul and Newport, definitely magic erasers. Matt and Holly, balloons. Marty and Gross Point, Bosco sticks for a dollar. Oh, here's a great one. Maureen, wrapping paper. Yep. You think about things that really don't matter? I understand that high-quality wrapping paper is easier to cut and easier to fold and yeah. all that. But the person that's receiving the gift doesn't, doesn't give an F. I agree. Now, for you, if you're wrapping, when you get that big, thick one with the grid on the back that you can just slide the scissors along and then all the creases are closer to perfect than, than the cheap stuff. There's no tearing. But the cheap stuff, the people that are receiving the gift do not care about the wrapping paper. Generally, no, do not care. TJ and East Point, I get my hangers from Dollar General. Joe and Chesterfield, movie, theater, candy. Can't get it anywhere else for a dollar. Brenda at work, disposable baking pans for the holidays. That's a good one. Okay. That is a good one. Yeah, I can see Even it. if you're like making or, you know, you're going to parties and you got to put food in something. Yeah. Here's another that pan. Here's another great one. Best thing to get at the dollar store, gift bags. I was just going to say that's gift a good bags. One. Yeah. That's gift a good bags one. are, that's a God, gift bags are great. They are fantastic. Although, understand the ones you're getting from the dollar store are probably going to break, but uh, hopefully not until after you've given the gift to somebody. Yeah. No, I like I like good answers here. Good answers here. Two four eight five three nine ninety seven ninety seven. All right, I mentioned good news from practice. There is a picture that has been tweeted from Ansar Khan. It is Dylan Larkin on skates at the start of Red Wing practice today. He's on the ice, people. He's on the ice. Well, he's practicing. That's good. Yep. So they said they would kind of evaluate him and make a call on Saturday. Today is Friday. So I would like to think that he, that this is a good sign. This is a good sign. And if you want to argue with me, feel free. But yes, he's back on the ice. My God, do they need Dylan Larkin. There are people getting in their cars, going out to lunch. They haven't heard the first half of the show. Much of it has been dedicated to what the hell is going on with the Red Wings. You keep waiting for that jump start, whether it's Lalone changing around the lines, the pairings on the blue line. Is it practice fights? Was that going to be the thing? No? Okay. How about this in-game fight where the same two guys are in a brawl together and then sitting in the penalty box together. Wasn't that going to be it with Sherratt and, Lar and, and Raymond? No, that didn't jumpstart. How about the crowd? Would the crowd get them going? Everybody understanding the sense of urgency. They'll get behind this hockey team and they'll be inspired. No, that didn't do it. Nothing did it last night. And we're at a point now where they are getting dangerously close to digging a hole in the playoffs. Right now, they're out of the playoffs based on the game in hand that the Islanders have, but the Red Wings play the Islanders at some point, so it's up to them to get those points back. However, the they've gone from well into the playoffs to now OF. <laughs> uh, and Lalone, I'm sure, has tried something. He, yeah, he's, he has mixed things up. They had some call-ups in the lineup last night. It's not going in the right direction. Now, the big picture... You can zoom out and see the picture of the, the season. When I zoom out and look at the picture of the season, Gator, I see a team that hasn't hasn't played well lately but has shown that they can play much better than this. And I don't think that's all evaporated in a week and a half here, two weeks. Zoom out and take a look at the Iser plan. Well, that's a different thing. 
But it, getting Larkin back is one big step. It would be a, a massive step forward. Um, and Helene St. James just tweeted out that uh, out since March 2nd, a lower body injury, he's skating with a wing state, not expected back before next week. So mm-hmm. anybody thinks he's going to play tomorrow night, not likely. So hopefully practices go well, no setbacks, get back to the lineup. I'm sure he's chomping at the bit to get back there too to try to contribute with this team and, and get him off this seven-game losing streak. That's it's so incredible to think. It's a seven-game losing streak following that six-game win streak. So he's when he's on the ice, and Larkin's on the ice, it's a third of the game. And was his impact so great that it made everybody else look that much better? And, I mean, that's what really, really good players do. But were other teams so preoccupied with slowing down Dylan Larkin that it created stuff for the guys on the blue line, for Debrinket, for Kane, for whoever was playing with him, Lucas Raymond, whatever, whatever combination. And... You know, you it doesn't feel like you can question his importance to this team. It doesn't feel like it should have led to a seven-game losing streak. I mean, he was suited up for the first couple of those games. Right. But they I, are bordering on, like, Michigan basketball uncompetitive here. I wonder if it's almost like blood in the water for other teams. Because, yes, there's an effect it has on its own team. But the other effect is that teams that may have thought they had no shot of making the playoffs. Mm-hmm. Now they're like, wait a minute, we can we can play better hockey. We get, we have to take advantage of this game right here because that's a wounded team. We're still fighting for something. You know, here comes Buffalo and they're, they're charging in. They're going to try to win this game. Uh, you know, the Coyotes getting to the end of a season where they have no shot of making the playoffs, but they want to show that they belong. We're going to take advantage of this team. We're going to play well. There's mm-hmm. pride involved, but it should go both ways. Yeah, well, they haven't responded. It's it's. It's concerning that they haven't responded because it's felt like a veteran team that could weather the storm without Dylan Larkin. People know how to. They've been around. They've been through these wars. They can step up. Everybody's a little bit more. Roles change a little bit. Hasn't worked. Well, and and, and you worry about the the domino effect that this has because you I, we we talked about it. Are they better with them in the lineup? Of course they are. And you take them out instead of somebody else stepping up to stop the dominoes from falling. The dominoes start to fall, and everyone else is is shifting to uh, more responsibility for you on this line. Well, wait, I'm not ready for it. And then the other line, everybody else has has to do more, and they're not capable of it. I find that hard to believe that they're not capable of it. But for whatever reason, collectively, they've been horrible in their own zone. They've made more mistakes. They're catastrophic mistakes. And for whatever reason, they're listless offensively. Outside for a – it feels like the only way they're going to score goals is on a power play or some fluke. 248-539-9797. Let's go to Adam here on 97 on the ticket. What's up, Adam? Hey, just wanted to give you guys a call. Um, I'm hoping I hear more calls similar to this because I'm hoping fans are, you know, as ticked off as I am. But just seems like an overall lack of leadership, certainly a lack of toughness dating back to last year. If you remember Ryan Reeves blowing our team up, a couple huge hits in that game. Um, so yeah, I mean, overall, I just, you know, even without Larkin, I, I, um, I, I'm wondering what, what exactly, um, is he bringing to the table when he's not in the lineup? You know, what leadership's going on, um, behind the scenes? Cause it doesn't seem like there is any, no toughness, no big hits or no fights throughout these seven games. Well, hold it's on. They showed some fight last night. They I got mean, into I, several I scraps. I didn't see anything major. Um, I mean, uh, your phone's your killing phone's us, killing Adam, but yeah. Well, it's far. I mean, it wasn't a fight last night. It was it was pushing and shoving. The guys were upset with what happened after a whistle, and that's fine, right? I mean, it's not the fights that we were used to seeing as hockey fans from twenty years ago when they were li- literally fights. It's it's a different it's, kind that's of that's a modern day fight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a modern day, which I has to even look at. It. But it's it, if you're going to criticize Larkin because he's not leading when he's he can't play. What's he supposed to do? Is he supposed to walk around the locker room and then pat guys on his shoulder? I mean, I, 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 he can do that to an extent, I guess, but really it, it, the leadership needs to come from somebody that's on the ice. Larkin can play a role, but there's a limit to that when you're not playing. Yes, there's absolutely a limit to that. And I got to tell you, the last person I'm blaming right now is the guy who's out injured and they haven't won since they – like, It's, there I, it's could amazing be some... how far out of the way people go to blame Dylan Larkin. Well – are you not realizing this is exactly how why he's so damn important to the team? 
It's not a coincidence. Now, should this be a seven-game losing streak? No, absolutely not. But you can't help but notice that the team has lost without him in the lineup. They're so much better with him in the lineup. And you could argue he makes people around him better. Is he a superstar? Nope. Is he a really good player? Yep. And his value is more than just goals and assists. And if you don't recognize that now, then you never will. Wow, one of the best in the game has just announced his retirement. We will get to that at 12-16. It's Carson Anderson, 97-1, the ticket. Aaron Donald has just announced his retirement. Wow. That's a wow. 
That is a wow. That's a wow. Had the Rams known this yesterday, would they have made a run at DJ Reader? <laughs> Did the Lions just steal DJ Reader out from under the Rams' nose? Did the Lions effectively end Aaron Donald's career? They did. Holy yes. <laughs> now, I guess maybe we should have seen this. There's been hints about this in previous seasons. Wasn't he going to retire after they won the Super Bowl? So, I don't know. Um, pretty surprised at that news. Aaron Donald is retiring from the NFL. I'm trying to make heads or tails on this cap situation or what his contract was. Yeah. I, I, you're a better man than me if you want to try to figure this out. Well, if a player retires, you don't take a cap hit because it's not like you cut it. No, or... but I'm wondering what happens if a team wants to contact Aaron Donald, you know, because he's still a Oh, and have him come out of yeah. retirement? Oh, they own his rights. Yeah. No, of course. That's what I'm seeing. What what's the what's the cap hit at this point if a team wanted him? He's thirty two years old. In his career so far, he has made this can't be right. No, all right. Uh hundred and fifty seven million dollars. So he's probably good for a few years on that. Um yeah. Aaron Donald retiring. I'm stunned. Yep. Uh, and yet I shouldn't be. Yeah, because he talked because about Because he this. talked about it. But, yeah. like just a, but there were no... But for months we haven't heard anything about it. Like, you know that you expect to hear some kind of inkling about this? I suppose we shouldn't be shocked here in Detroit with what Barry Sanders <laughs> did. Um, yeah, could you imagine a, a one of your players walking away from the game <laughs> still with gas in the tank? If only you could imagine what that would be like. And yet he's doing it a full month before the draft. Huh. Our guy didn't. Oh, no. he did it right. Field Yates, training camp. Field Yates just sent out a, f- a hilarious tweet from ESPN. Minutes after announcing his retirement for the NFL, Aaron Donald has been inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Yeah. <laughs> so, but along the Barry lines, will the Rams pay him the rest of his contract? All the bonus that yeah. he's due? I don't know, man. I don't want to. Do you want to reopen that one? I don't really want to, but it's kind of fun. Same thing with Calvin, right? Yeah. Look, that era of Reliance football is behind us. We don't even need to talk about it. Not quite sure why you brought it up. Just to be a jerk. Yeah. So Aaron Donald announcing his retirement for the NFL. Big news. You guys still think the Lions made the right choice in drafting Ebron? <laughs> Two four eight. Sure, they got DJ Reader now. Five three nine. Ninety seven ninety seven. I mean, if they ha- if they hadn't drafted Eric Ebron, we wouldn't have DJ Reader. That's why I look at it too. <laughs> I, I Thanks for putting it in perspective, Gator. I'm here for you. Although, seriously, if you are a Rams fan, doing this at the end of the week of free agency, they knew. He, I bet you, he told them beforehand. I mean, they just, I would they, hope, he they would. Spent I would a, hope so. A ton of money on their two interior guards. I think they knew they were getting some money. Somewhere. He had restructured his contract to free up money. As well, yeah. his latest contract. He had a three-year, ninety-five million dollar extension. Um, at sixty-five million in guarantees. Wow, but that's so. According to Spot Track guys, ago. apparently Aaron Donald has a thirty million dollar two hundred or thirty million dollar twenty twenty-four compensation set to lock in at four p.m. today Eastern. So I don't know when it becomes official or not, but I'm sure he's let management know. I mean, he knows his contract situation. I'm sure he talked to his his agent and everything. Yeah, that um, I if he walked away from that money he was due, that's um, is that applaudable or is that stupid? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, part of me thinks if he walked away from money he was due, there would have to be an agreement of some kind settlement yeah you would think that being said do you think he stays retired i like to take people at their word that yes they will stay retired but uh, I don't know. so no, i don't know the man so here's what we've lost i'm not qualified to answer that question 
So J.J. Watt, now Aaron Donald. Yep. We had two massive defensive players. We have entered the Aiden Hutchinson era of elite D-line. Have we? I hope so. <laughs> 248 Phone calls, feedback. Uh, we'll get to this trade the Vikings made now with two first-round picks. What are they up to? That at 1231. Back to your open line calls. We go to Chad. You're next. You're on 97 on the ticket. Hi, Chad. Hey, guys. How's it going? Good. Thank you. Good. So my call was about, uh, to borrow your word, the Iser plan. Yeah. Uh, and, and while I love the guy, uh, he clearly sent a message this year that he does not think the Wings are going to compete for a Stanley Cup or whatever because he didn't do anything at the trade deadline. Do you think the players felt that and knew it, and that's why they've underperformed since the do-nothing trade deadline? Well, it, so the question is, did he do nothing or were there no trades available to him that would have made him better for the price that they were asking? Right. Fair enough. I mean, you got to yep. trust Eiserman. Yep. I mean, but, I don't have to trust him, but I always keep that in the well, back of my mind. Um, if the play, look, this is a veteran team. They shouldn't give up on a year. In fact, Steve Eiserman, the message that he might have sent to them is I believe that these right. guys can make the playoffs. We don't need additions. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Yep. Yeah, I, the think corner, a, I, I think the chemistry of this team going into the trade deadline probably played a big role into why that they didn't um, make additions. I mean, because if you make an addition, you got to make a subtraction. You know, even if you're even right. if you're trading away just a draft pick compensation to get somebody on the roster, that meant somebody had to leave the roster still. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair enough. And they, I mean, and they traded away in theory a great guy, so I don't know. It feels like this team has a high floor and a low ceiling. They can't have been that fragile, right? I can't imagine that's it. I, I I don't know. I don't know why they don't come out with more jump. I don't know why they don't uh they don't look inspired. I, I don't know why it is. It's obviously the the players are frustrated. We know that. They foil over in practice the other day. They talked about it after the game last night that it's frustrating. Um but they'll have another opportunity to, to, to change it up tomorrow night. And it feels like every game from here on out is must win. Last night sucked because there was an opportunity to win while some of the teams that you're chasing or that are chasing you were losing. And you could have put a little bit of distance. Yep. And you failed to do so. 248 539 97 Dave and Ipsy, you're next. Hello, Dave. Uh, hi. Uh, after I tell you why I'm not that excited about Jacob Job, I'm going to have a question to ask you. But uh, I'm not really excited uh, about Jacob Job. I'm not going to get over excited about Jackson, him. Jackson Job. Uh, yeah, Jackson Job. Uh, because uh, I'm excited that maybe he'll uh, help Toledo win a championship. Uh, but it's almost inevitable that these young 100-mile-an-hour prospects uh, usually get injured and usually end up having to go through Tommy John surgery. Uh, so now I'm more excited about uh, Casey Mize and uh, Screwball and Manning because they've already been through the surgeries and the injuries. So I'm hoping that they learn uh, how to pitch smarter so maybe they won't get injured this year. So a lot of it has to do with delivery. I should reach out to my guy because I've talked a lot about why I was in favor of trading Fulmer after his rookie year and why I was worried about Mize. And it had a lot to do with their delivery and and how they the way that they um, their 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 delivery made them high injury risk candidates. Um, I haven't asked about Jackson Job, so I'll see what I can find out. Some guys can throw okay. that hard and not get hurt, but there is there is some data that supports certain deliveries making more prone to injury. Well, now I have a question for you. Good. Uh, okay, now Casey Mize, uh, then he threw a fork ball or a, or a split finger fastball. And uh, everybody pretty much knows that that can hurt your arm. Uh, so my question is, do these coaches in the minor leagues, these pitching coaches and the pitching coaches in college, uh, do, they, uh, not a, do they teach these uh, pitchers how to pitch smarter? And, or do they just yes. do whatever they want Yes. and have no concern over their arm? No, they, they have concerns over their arms. They do. And they try to advise them as best they can. Some guys are just more prone to injury than others, but yeah, they're not. The I mean, days of the, who was the Rice coach that threw Kenny Ball 180 uh, pitches in a game? Like those days are kind of over. Yeah, they are, and so are, I guess so are the days of you know having a workhorse like Jack Morris who threw the fork ball constantly uh, and really had a kind of an injury-free career. Yeah, you just everybody's different. 
248-539-9797. All right, why are the Vikings up to getting a second first-round pick? We'll get to that today at 1232. It's Carson Anderson, 97, won the ticket.
All right, a lot of diagnosis. What the hell's wrong with the Red Wings? Another loss last night. Of course, a boost team that looked when that game was over. They all had the what the hell is going on kind of look on their faces as they skated off the ice. In the meantime, Lions get DJ Reader. Coming up a little bit later on, I'll tell you why I really like this signing. Uh, Aaron Donald just announced at this hour, just announced his retirement from the NFL, much to the delight of quarterbacks all around the league. And now uh, we can say we effectively ended his career, right? Last game in Detroit, lost to the Lions. It doesn't really make up for the not drafting him 10 years ago. But, uh, and also today the Vikings made a trade. Minnesota Vikings add another first round pick. They spin their second round pick at 43 and their sixth round pick at 188 and their second round pick next year. So two twos and a sixth to the Texans for the Texans pick at 23 this year and 232, which is a seventh round pick. Which has everybody trying to figure out, all right, are they getting an extra first round pick for like Michael Penix or Bo Nix? Or are they getting those two first round picks to try and move up to secure the third or fourth quarterback, whether it be Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, they don't think JJ's going to be there at 11, so they want that extra pick at 23 to move up a few spots and jump ahead of the Giants. Yeah, at six. Chargers don't need a quarterback. Would they? Are they calling the Chargers with their two firsts now? Did the because a lot of times this don't come to us unless you're willing to give up two firsts. All right, let's go get a first. Well, the the draft value chart values those two first round picks right around 2,000 points. 2,000 points slots right bit in right between pick three and pick four. It's 2,200 points for pick three. It's 1,800 picks for pick four. So I guess you're asking the Patriots if they'd be willing to trade out so that you could definitely get the third quarterback in the draft. Do you do that? Would would the Patriots do that? And then the Patriots can say, okay, great. We'll we'll look at Penix or or Knicks. Um, perhaps McCarthy if he if he's not in there. I, my first thought when I heard that this morning was that they are doing what I said all along is trade back in late in the first round and take Penix or Knicks and take what you need at, at 11, whether it's a wide receiver, it well, it wouldn't be wide receiver, uh, you know, offensive lineman or whatever it is you're looking for. I would think it's offensive line. And then you take one of those other quarterbacks there. You still get the fifth year and you're getting a quality quarter. I mean, Knicks was packed. 12 player of the year. We know Penix can throw. Both those guys are really good. You know, is, is the quarterback, is Drake May that much better? J.J. McCarthy that much better? I mean, that's up for the, the, the talent evaluators to figure out. But because they did it this early, it tells me that they've got a deal already worked out Could with be. another team. Could be. And I would have to imagine that it's either with New England at three or they're going to settle on the fourth quarterback and, and, and uh, you know, Use that maybe they trade with Arizona at four. So it's funny charge. because we're getting a lot of feedback and watching and paying attention to what's going on. And they, they, we've I've noticed quite a bit of feedback that implies that the NFC North is going to be the toughest division in football. But the NFC North also might have two teams with rookie quarterbacks. Yeah. We don't know that Justin Fields is going to get shipped out. It seems like the market has dried up for Justin Fields. So if they want Caleb Williams, they might actually be stuck with Justin Fields. Uh, there's also in Minnesota, they just got Sam Darnold, which I mean, Sam Darnold feels like one of those quarterbacks that has some good, but doesn't feel like a guy that you would build a competitive team around and, or they'll have a rookie quarterback. So that kind of, if there is a chance, and that doesn't mean those teams won't be good with those rookies eventually, but the rookie transition to the NFL is a tough one. It is tough. And what C.J. Stroud did last year is not normal. Nope. It's not normal at all. And it kind of came out of, out of the blue because you don't expect the rookie quarterbacks to have that impact. And it's not like he goes to a team that had all these offensive weapons just waiting for that rookie to set in. 
I mean, automatically he clicked with Nico Collins, but nobody thought that Nico Collins was this next breakout wide receiver. You know, you look at the the Houston Texans, you thought, okay, this is a team that's going to do things defensively, they got a defensive-minded head coach, here they go. But no, it was C.J. Stroud was great. But it doesn't happen. I mean, it can, it just typically does not. So to think that you're going to get it done, you know, with, with a rookie quarterback, good luck with that. I think it will take, although the Bears making that big move today, or last night for Keenan Allen. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, that just that kind of go oh, wait a second. What 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 happened here? And then they've already added DeAndre Swift who, you know, is in is a nice weapon out of the backfield as well. If if he can stay healthy, he's really good. Um that Caleb Williams can walk into a really nice situation with Chicago. I think that's what they're trying to set yeah. up. And and the Vikings would have an interesting situation because they have great weapons to throw to. And now they have uh, what Aaron Jones is the running back over there because because Green Bay let him go. Yeah, so <laughs> division could be interesting, but if there's two rookie quarterbacks, I still feel good about their chances. I still feel very good about the Lions' chances. And if it's not two rookie quarterbacks, I'm mean, I'm trying to think between Chicago and Minnesota, what is the scenario that scares me the most? And it's probably. Chicago keeping fields, trading out of the number one spot, adding even more talent like Marvin Harrison to go with that group of wide receivers and proving the O-line. No, it doesn't. But that's the scenario that in the short term would Mm -hmm. scare me the most. In the short term, sure. I would agree with that in the short term. In reality, it seems like that's not what's going to happen. They're going to go with Caleb Williams. He's got some weapons to work with, and they would have another, you know, the pick at nine, do you improve the offensive line or, or do you go defense? Whatever you do, you're going to improve your team. And maybe Caleb Williams is that C.J. Stroud type. I mean, people think he's the best quarterback to to, to come out, even better than uh, Trevor Lawrence when he was thought of as coming out. Um, so this is a long time coming. People have been waiting for his coronation to, to be drafted, and it'll happen in this draft. But the Vikings situation a quarterback can step in and, and do really well. I mean, keep in mind, Kirk Cousins was having a really nice season and gets hurt. Who was the guy that, that, that was quarterback uh, against the Lions? Nick uh, Mullins. Nick Mullins. Nick Mullins, in two games, threw for like 800 yards against the Lions. Now, Nick Mullins is not a very good starting quarterback in the NFL, but he was able to do that, A, because the Lions secondary wasn't all that good, but two, more importantly, the Vikings are already offense. Yep. That, that offense is ready to go. So is it inconceivable to think that a rookie quarterback can step into Minnesota and make something happen? It is. It's, it's funny. The, the quarterback thing, somebody tweeted out earlier this week about the 2021 class, which came with much hype, and quarterbacks went one, two, three, just like it's expected to be this year. And that had five quarterbacks in the top 15. That was considered a strong quarterback class. Trevor Lawrence, he's good, and yeah. he seems to be trending in the right direction, but it's still some questions. Zach Wilson... <laughs> Mess. Yep. Trey Lance Oof. didn't work out. Justin Fields, the Bears might be pulling the plug. And Mac Jones traded to yep. be Trevor Lawrence's backup for a six round pick. So the I I I can appreciate the excitement about the quarterbacks and how there's a great class and how guys are gonna and then you look back at that. So was that class. And nobody's got an elite quarterback. Lawrence still, I'm not giving up on Lawrence, but that's it's so tough to uh, predict. Yeah, I think Lawrence is, is going to be a good quarterback, but th- that draft class is also different because that was the COVID year. You know, you had, that was the shortened year, um, and guys being drafted because of the 2020 season. So it's the 2021 draft. It, you had no idea what you were getting with Trey Lance, right? It was all based on potential. You hadn't really seen him play. You know, t- there were so many games that were canceled that football season. It was just a strange draft all around. That being said, I understand the comparison. This draft, this is a weird one because I think that the, the, the people are, are sleeping on the guys that are the, the four and five quarterbacks in this draft uh, or, or the five and six quarterbacks in the draft um, and paying too much attention to the top four guys. Yeah, sometimes you have 2021, Doug, with the, the bust that you mentioned, but then sometimes you have 2020 with Burrow, Herbert, Tua, you know, like... Burrow, Herbert. Yeah, you just... <laughs> You just don't. To, uh, <laughs> say it. He won't, he won't say it. it. He's not going to say it. Don't make him because he's not going to. But, no, you, you don't know. You're right. You don't know. But the the Vikings situation is the scary one because they have ready-made players. Justin Jefferson might be the best when healthy 
receiver in the league right now. He also might hold out. And, yeah, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. But assuming he plays and their defense yeah. and with Brian Flores getting their defense Jordan back Addison's going. Jordan yeah. really good. Obviously, so, they've got the tight end. We saw C.J. Stroud did. Not every quarterback's going to come in running like that or you know winning like that and playing that well. But the Colts took Anthony Richardson, and he only got to play a few games. They were 9-8. and eight. He went out. They, they plugged that in with Gardner Minshew. You know, young quarter, young teams now that draft high, they can get good quickly. So if your quarterback play from a rookie is just competent, if not good like C.J. Stroud, yeah, you'd be something to worry about. I still think the Lions are going to win this division, as everyone should. But the window may not be as big as we thought. Because even if the Vikings and Bears aren't good next year, following year, they could be ready to go. Yeah, obviously, should- the Packers are really good. Carson Anderson, open lines. DJ Reader, why I really like the addition. We'll get to that today at 1250. Phone calls and feedback mixed in, 971. Get your lawn right this spring and summer. Call Natural Way Lawn and Tree Service where you get green and stay green with Natural Way. 888-GET-GREEN is the telephone number. And for a limited time, you purchase a full lawn program. You get free grub control, but you got to mention me, Scott the Gator Anderson. You don't want to wait. You want to get green and stay green. You can even save some green when you prepay. Call by the end of the month to get that early bird discount, and it's great. And you want to get on the schedule early because of crabgrass. You want to control that crabgrass. By, uh, you hate to see it in the summertime, and frankly, uh, by the time you see crabgrass, it's too late to fix it. So much easier to prevent a problem is to fix one, so call them right now. Each lawn is assigned its own specialist. They have certified applicators and arborists, the custom tailor solutions specifically for your yard and your home. They offer the 100% satisfaction guarantee. It's a company that I've trusted for almost a dozen years now, locally owned for almost 30 years. It's Natural Way Lawn and Tree Service. Call them today, 888-GET-GREEN, or go to naturalwaylawn.com.
You're a bit of a mess. I was. I got lost last night leaving LCA. I was trying to hit the lodge heading north, and uh, they had everything blocked off so I couldn't get on where I thought I was going to be able to get on. And then I kept going and got kind of turned around a little bit, and uh, and there was a car next to me, and he rolls his window down and trying to get my attention. I'm like, yeah. He goes, your lights aren't on. I'm like, what? Because your lights aren't on. My lights aren't on. I'm like, my lights aren't on. How is that? Because I always have that on automatic when it yeah. gets dark, I had to come on. But I just I remembered, well, I had to get a new tire for the car, and the car went to the dealership, and clearly somebody had. Those sons of bitches. <laughs> changed the, <laughs> the setting on it. And I'm like, uh, oh, here it is. Well, and then glad I, you and, made it home safe. Well, I eventually, yeah, I, I ended up going way out of the way. And I'm like, where am I? And then came to an intersection, and I'm like, Okay, I know West Grand Boulevard. I'm just going to head. And how am I going west? Mm-hmm. Let's go east. Here we go. And when I see the Fisher Building or Henry Ford Hospital, I know where I'm at. And I it see, took me a while, and finally it showed up. And when I see Battle Creek, I know I've gone too far. <laughs> the other direction, yeah. So, uh, news on DJ Reader yesterday. Yesterday during the show, we told you this might happen. Actually, we said I made a prediction it would happen. It was now the the one thing that I, I was way off on apparently was the money. We'll see what the money shakes out at. It's the the contract that won't be filed. It doesn't need to be filed right away. So there's some uncertainty as to exactly how much money it is. There are reports that it could get up in the mid twenties over two years, which seems like a lot of money. Um, but look, if you're worried about the injury and the injuries that he has had, I kind of get it. But when I started perusing the field of free agent candidates, you start realizing so many guys are hurt in the NFL. You are either a guy that has been hurt in the past or a guy who's going to be hurt in the future. That's the National Football League. So you can't not take chances. Otherwise, you will limit yourself to a very few number of players that you're interested in acquiring. With that said, DJ Reader, and you mix that in with uh, pretty much all of their guys, and you know Davenport and Davis, et cetera, et cetera. They have gone out of the. <laughs> they haven't shied away from injured players, and it's it's probably we're probably particularly sensitive to it because two of their big free agent acquisitions last year both did virtually nothing for them this past season, and C.J. Gardner Johnson and Emmanuel Mosley. But between the money and the injury history, the football player they are getting, I think, helps them a lot. First of all, in listening to him talk yesterday. He seems totally like a Detroit Lion type player. He was a team captain in Cincinnati, which tells you a lot about him fitting the mold of what Dan Campbell and Brad Holmes are looking for. He did say the recovery from injury is going better than expected and better than it did the first time he had a quadriceps injury and expects to be back at practice, uh, ready to go for next season. Uh, And it feels like he did his homework on the Detroit Lions. Had a lot to say about Aline McNeil and his game. Had a lot to say about Aiden Hutchinson and his game. And says he'll draw from his experience in Cincinnati as part of a team that was rising up and making a run at a championship. So now he's going to do it for us. What are they getting on the field? Well, they're getting a guy that's known as an elite run stuffer and a guy who last year had more QB pressures from the defensive tackle spot than anybody on the Lions. Was he as good as as Chris Jones, who had 56 QB pressures and led the, led the league from that position? Uh, no. He had 22 of them. But that's more than the league yeah. McNeil had. Well, he's not Aaron Donald. He's not... 45 he's, QB pressures. Yeah, he's not one of these guys. The Matabuike had 43. Uh, Christian Wilkins okay, had Wilkins. 41 QB pressures. Yeah, he's not one of these guys. He's a, he's a big step below that when it comes to pass rushing. But he is a disruptive force. He is a run stuffer, and it adds to the strength of the Lions team, which is their on their defense anyway, which is their defensive line. That's good. He wins the press conference. I think what was cool yesterday is they brought him in yesterday, and then later in the afternoon, here they are, they signed him, and he's talking. You know, it feels like this is one of those things would take a, a day or two to process. Nope, he was all in. And when he's talking and he says things like he's ready to run through a brick wall, you love to hear that stuff and automatically go... That's why they got him, because that's a that's a Dan Campbell guy, 100%. And he's got the the ability to back it up, too. It's not just lip service. So it, it, it can make sense here. And I think to an extent, it, it does make sense. 
the contract, I'd like to hear what it, what really is, but it's a two-year deal. It could be, you know, $13 million a season. Um, is that money that's well spent? And have they spent the money well this well, offseason? That remains to be seen. So here's the thing that we need to consider, okay? What is clear is that Brad Holmes has an eye on not only this year's cap situation, but next year's cap situation and the year after. And if there were easy decisions to be made in terms of clearing cap space, I think they might have been a bigger player for a luxurious Sneed or a Daniil Hunter. The problem is, if you consider next year's cap situation, you say, well, they could have fit luxurious Sneed under this year's cap. Yes, but what if it cost you Amon Ra? And I think that's why these decisions are so hard for them to make is because they don't want to commit so much money to the 2025 and 2026 roster that they find that they can't afford to fit one of their cornerstone players that they have drafted. They know. They know what they're getting. They don't want to lose one of those guys. And I can understand it. I I have gotten to a point, and I, I think I've probably taken some criticism for this. I am so intrigued with the way the Lions have done it, and I'm so happy with the way this guy drafts that I just want to see him cook, and I'll just sit back and watch. And kind of give a blanket approval because he's been pretty consistent. What they've done has worked. And it's clear that they're spreading the money over a number of positions and not spreading the money, not just taking the money and going, we're going all in with an elite corner or elite edge rusher. And that's going to take up the bulk of our, our free agent money. They've gotten better in the secondary, not with one player. But the players that they have brought in are better than what they ended the season with last year. They've gotten better on the defensive line. DJ Reader is better than Isaiah Bugs was or Benito Jones was or whomever, insert your defensive tackle that played next to Aleem. They are better there now. They are weaker at the guard spot. The interior of the offensive line needs to be addressed. They probably need a third wide receiver. And they probably need to add to the edge rushers. But you can see this team doesn't have an abundance of needs. And they have gotten better. Now, Christian Wilkins is a better player than DJ Reader. But DJ Reader doesn't handcuff them moving forward. No, he's not costing you $30 million a year. But he's going to cost you not only this upcoming season, but will likely cost you the following season because that's the two-year deal unless it's one of his contracts is easy to get out and under. We, That's why we have to wait and see. Yeah, what we it, don't know the is. numbers, which is is something that fascinates me, to be honest with you, is is this a kind of contract that when you actually see it, you go, okay, so it's a one-year deal. Or, okay, so next year there's not a lot of there's not a lot of financial commitment. Yeah, well, because there's a big commitment to two players right now that they that they've gotten in the in this offseason. Carlton Davis, $14 million. And now DJ Reader, which looks to be at least $13 million. So that's that's a big chunk of change to two guys for the upcoming season. However, I thought DJ Reader was nine. I don't I Okay. Don't, whatever it's gonna yeah. be. Um it's probably nine with with incentives that are easy to reach, I'm guessing. But we'll see. So those two guys, though, are at positions. I don't know if defensive tackle was a, a massive position of need. Defensive back was. So even if it's just for the one year, okay, but then you start looking at the compensation, which was a third-round pick. You don't like giving up a third-round pick for for a rental player for one season, do you? Don't know. I mean, yes, you get two six-round picks in if, return. If, but. if he puts you over the top, uh, but, I mean, he's a tough one to he's a tough one to know about because his strength hasn't, I guess, been on display in Tampa, which is man coverage. So – if he's going to be a man coverage guy here and kill it, then then it, mu- it could be a great signing. 248-539-9797. We'll get to more of your phone calls and feedback coming up. Uh, why I like the signing. I know some people don't. And look, you, you can make, they could have afforded Daniel Hunter, right? They could have put Daniel, gotten Daniel Hunter under the cap, but they, they've tried to spread the money out. And, you know, you either... If you if you hate it, I don't know what to tell you other than it's just it's a different way of doing things. And I'm in a in a homes we trust kind of place. But I uh, question it. I mean, 
everybody's going to have their own opinions on it, and I, I want to see what the full thing is, uh, the full product is before they, you know, close up shop for good here on, on free agency, which that may not even happen until you get through uh, training camp in, in August. Carson Anderson, 97 won the ticket. It's the worst slump of the year at the worst time for the Red Wings. They've lost a season-high seven straight games now on the outside looking in in the wildcard race. Forward David Perron calls this losing streak unacceptable. The Wings still stuck at 72 points, one spot behind the Islanders for the last wild card. They've got yet another chance to get back on track tomorrow afternoon at Little Caesars Arena against the Buffalo Sabres. The Wings, though, they've won, or the Pistons, rather, they've won three out of their last four games. They're playing some of their best basketball of the year, and they're in action against the Miami Heat tonight at Little Caesars Arena. Cade Cunningham is questionable. He's managing his left knee injury. Tip off at 7 o'clock. Michigan State taking on top seed Purdue this afternoon, halftime right now in the quarterfinals of the Big Ten Tournament. And three-time defensive player of the year, Los Angeles Rams defensive tackle Aaron Donald is retiring from the NFL. At the Coriol Health Sports Desk, I'm Luke Sloan. For more, go to 97 the ticket or Odyssey.com. Doug Carr, Scott Anderson, 97 on the ticket. Thank you, Luke. Did you see the uh, the tweet that Kyler Murray had? Was it a picture of him and Aaron Donald bearing down on him? <laughs> well, what he wrote in the tweet? I did not see what he wrote. I saw that. Let me uh, read this. Uh, here it is. Honored to have competed against the best of all time, Aaron Donald. Enjoy your retirement, and please don't come back. <laughs> I think there was another one where it, when the initial announcement came out and he was like, thank God. 
Kyler Murray taking a, a a break from Fortnite to tweet out something on social media. <laughs> <laughs> too soon? No, it's Shots never fired. too soon. Not our problem. 248-539-9797. Oh, let's get back to your open line coast uh, calls. Carl is next here on 971. Hello, Carl. Hey Doug, how you doing? Good hey, Carl. Carl. So I know you said, you know, in Brad Holmes we trust him. We trust in Brad Holmes. But like like your next show, like Mike's show and other analysts, they said the salary cap is not real. So <laughs> if you can go after Jerry Sneed, why not go after him too if you can't? Why is Jerry Sneed hey, why is Legerius Sneed available? You said what now? Why is Legerius Sneed available? Why is he available? Yes. Uh, do you want me to answer the question? Because available. the salary cap is real. <laughs> if it weren't well, real, well, they would the never be getting rid of him. Well, and now they're not. Now they've found a way to keep him. Oh, so now, now they okay. So I hadn't, I hadn't seen that part of it yet. Well, no, I'm, I'm actually, it's, it's back and forth. Yeah, it's okay. They started. We have to trade him. We have to trade him, and then what happens? Patrick Mahomes goes out, restructures a contract, and then they convince the luxurious need to play into the, uh, the, the. The franchise tag, but they look who's going to come back. But there is going to be other guys that get cut because of that. Perhaps. I mean, why? Why, just, why, why is Mike Williams? How, why was Mike Williams let go by the by the Chargers? I think that well, the Chargers are, that's legit with what they have uh, for sure. Unless because they were the to get salary somebody. cap is real. Yeah, but they could. I'm just saying it was real at Kansas City until it wasn't. Well, we'll see what happens there because there's going to have to be more moves to fit them under the cap. All right, well, thanks a lot, Doug. Yeah, no, it's okay. There are ways to finagle. Eventually, you pay the piper. I yeah. mean, they, they didn't want to lose Tyreek Hill. And no, but so, then they realized that it's better to have Patrick Mahomes than it is to have Tyreek Hill. It's better to have them both. Well, sure, but if you can, if you've got the cap's not look, real, if you've got Patrick Mahomes, you can do a lot of things. Well, that's that. It makes I mean, it that, a, that's where it's a little unfair. It makes you survive some some other things. Yeah. But and, and if you're the Chargers and you got all these contracts, but you haven't won a damn thing. There's, there's, then maybe you're not trying as hard to hang on to everybody. Well, no, but, and maybe you made some stupid contracts. There are cap, there are cap issues like Buffalo. Tell Buffalo who's lost 13 free agents or whatever that the cap isn't real. They knew they went all in for last year, didn't work out, and right, but now they they're also, paying the piper. But Buffalo has also been a team that's been competing for a Super Bowl for the last three years. Yep. Okay. The Lions are in year one of sort of doing it. They went in to last off season going. We'll worry about next year. Next year, but Look, it's the, the the idea that the cap isn't real is one I'm not accepting. Well, it's not as real as as perhaps it's it's made out. I, of course, it's real. Okay, and you will have to. And you, at some point, you're going to have to make a hard decision. I just think the way they had the Lions, I think have been smart about it because I think when they'll have multiple players that come up, they'll have multiple opportunities to restructure and keep this window as open as long as possible. But yes, at some point. The window's going to close, and you're going to be wow. stuck with a bunch of contracts, and you're going to have to bid adieu five years down the line to, to somebody that you're like, oh, I didn't want to lose him. There, there's a reason why our guy Disner, the cap dude, was coveted elsewhere and has um, has has done a good job. And there's a reason that Kansas City continues to win Super Bowl. Well, the biggest is. Yeah. They got the, they got the unicorn. Good for them. 248-539-9797. Phone calls, feedback. Oh. Here. They, I'm sorry. They have the unicorn, and they're also able to hang on to their big players, except Tyreek Hill. Except to, okay, except Tyreek Hill, and they've won what two Super Bowls since they let Tyreek Hill go. Well, I'm not saying you can't win, but the cap is real. Hill is an example of the cap being real. Those are two different arguments. You're making an argument for one thing. Just, We're talking about something else, right? And it looked like it was real because they're going to lose Snead, and they're not. Well, they might lose other players because of that, because the cap is real. Stevie is next. Or Stevie, sorry, sends us the following. Everyone needs to relax. My 10-year plan is right on course. That's from Stevie. Oh, see what he's there. Yep. Next one. I think Eisenman definitely should get some blame. I'm not saying go all in at the trade deadline, but adding a player definitely would have helped his team, and somebody needs to be held accountable for Simon Evans and not being called up. It's getting very frustrating. Defense is an issue. He can only help. That's from Marlon. Now, he's hurt, right? Isn't that you came back from the game last night knowing he's hurt, Edvinson? Uh yeah, that he got hurt over the weekend uh, blocking a shot, but I'm not sure. I don't think it's he's out for long term. He's banged up, they say. Yeah. 
the article I read says he's banged up. We <laughs> we could read text about the patch all day long. Uh, it's <laughs> it's not the patch. It's not the patch. Two four eight five three nine ninety seven ninety seven. Tyler is next on ninety seven on the ticket. Hello, Tyler. What up, though? What up, though? Hey, Tyler. So, um, I know earlier you were saying the Lions need to be afraid of the Bears if they keep Justin Fields, and yeah, we do. I completely agree because we don't do good with mobile quarterbacks at all. And like I'm gonna say it right now, Brock Purdy looked like a Lamar Jackson in that last game in the second half. So. If the Bears keep Justin Fields, the Lions really need to really worry. But I think we well. Th- let me be clear about what was said, Tyler. the The question was: is what scenario in Minnesota and Chicago are the most dangerous? Because if you introduce rookie quarterbacks in both, or the Vikings are rolling with Sam Darnold, those don't scare me as much as the Bears with these weapons and Justin Fields. I think that's the most yep. dangerous scenario. For those two teams, one of them to threaten Detroit. Yeah, I, to be honest, I, I don't have any faith in Sam Darnold. I'm gonna keep it a book. Uh, <laughs> Sam Darnold is is come on. He, yeah, I mean, I, I get it, but it, come on. Yeah, I'm not. Sam look, Darnold. Sam Darnold's done some good things in this league, but he's not a guy you build a championship team around. Yeah, I'm about to say key, key, key words. Some some good things. Some some. Yeah, few and far between. Lot, but, yeah. <laughs> Best thing, best thing he did was come back after throwing a pick six in his first game ever in the in the league. It was against the Lions. I mean, if he didn't, I mean, you know, if he didn't do that, you know, he not he's not he's not going to be talked about. He's not so, a good you know, quarterback. He had, he had, he had, he's not a good yeah, quarterback at all. DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, Cole Komet, DeAndre Swift, those are some weapons to work with in Chicago. Yeah, and if you want to use your second first round pick on another one, you can go ahead and do that. If they keep Fields though and trade out of one. Oh, the, the the sky's the limit of what they can do. I mean, imagine the what 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 trade capital you'll get or what draft capital you'll get if you were to move out. That's the top pick in the draft. Say, Everybody wants Caleb this. Williams. I will say this, not to cut you off, but I will say if they give away Justin Fields and go tra- draft the quarterback, I'm not worried at all. I'm not. I'm keep it. I understand there's some good quarterbacks in the draft, but I'm not really too much worried because they're a rookie. Like you said, it's a rookie quarterback. It's who knows. CJ CJ Stroud was amazing. Do you, do you, come on. He That's was not the, the norm. Almost one. No, yeah, that you was, know you get what I'm saying. That was not so the norm. If they draft one. It's like okay, bet we kind of good. I feel like we like. Of course, I'm, I'm confident we're gonna win the division, but I. It just depends if Justin Fields really stays there. It's like uh okay. There's something to really, you know, we got to have our antennas up on, on Chicago this well, year. Well, yeah, look, I mean, I if I were Chicago, I've been trying to trade the number one pick all along. And I'm not sure what to believe because there's reports out of Chicago that they, hey, they're just going to roll with fields and trade the pick. No, they're committed to taking Caleb Williams. I don't know what the hell they're doing. I just know that some of what they've done this offseason worries me. Uh, just from a standpoint, if they seem to be doing it right, they did trade for a guy from Buffalo that might have been cut <laughs> the next day because Buffalo had their big purge the day after they shipped that guy off to Chicago. Two four eight five three nine ninety seven ninety seven. Hey, we got the big old tub of pretzels that we will open Ooh. up shortly. Uh, get to some of your questions from that. The Detroit Red Wings lose last night, which is nothing new. They got to pull out of this. Dylan Larkin, we mentioned earlier, was on the ice, but it was only at the start of practice. So apparently he didn't go through practice. Uh, To say that they would, I would very much like to see him back on the ice and healthy. I mean, everybody everywhere would probably like to see that. Well, he'll be healthy when he's healthy enough to play. Yeah, and as soon as he is, please, please, please let that be the answer because this has been an absolute mess. 248-539-9797. It's Carson Anderson, 97 won the ticket.
Oh. What? Javi Baez swung on 3-0. and <laughs> <laughs> From Tigers t- Torque Moyle. Javi Baez swinging 3-0. and Lines out to center field. Well, if he hit it hard. Hey, lined out. Listen, 3-0 pitch. You know, you got to get something good to hit. <laughs> He's back. He sorted it all out, people. Oh, man. I have a feeling we're going to take a lot of calls about Javi Baez this year. What? I wonder. Here's the thing. There's, You know how the level of fandom you get? You get the, the hardcore baseball person that's like a huge baseball fan that follows the game and the salaries and the some of the analytics and contracts. And then you get sort of the, the guy who kind of has their eye on it. And then there's the, the fan that, you know, is just casual. Will any hardcore core baseball people say, I understand why they haven't released him because they have so much money wrapped up in him and they have to exhaust the resource. And Oh, by the way, he's good in the field and there's a rookie at, at second base and hell by the end of this year, there might be a rookie at third base. The only value he has until he can show they can hit again is he's plays he plays really well defensively. That's it. As far as the money's concerned, this guy, I mean, obviously he's making whatever it is, twenty five million a year and still has a contract for a few more years. Yeah. I mean, if he's not fielding and he's not hitting Well, that's a different thing. Then he's got then you can't play him and, and you can't have him on your roster. And like, then you, it sucks, and you're going to have to eat that, but you're going to have to eat it if that's the case. It's hard to tell somebody, hey, the $96 million he's owed, you're just going to pay that, and we're getting nothing out of him when he can field. And it 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 might be more important in this infield for now. For now. But I, I don't know I'll if anybody... I'll wait till May. <laughs> Let's wait till May and see what happens. The key word I said is, it might might be important for this roster for now. Well, the question the Tigers ultimately going to have to ask themselves is: Are they are they winning more games without him than with him? And if the answer is you're winning more games without him, then the cost of doing business is swallowing ninety six million dollars. If Kreidler starts hit, tearing the cover off the ball and is playing adequate defense, if Eddie's Leonard proves that he can play the position in the field, it might expedite any decision. All right, let's uh, let's open up a big old tub pretzel for the question of the day. These are questions sent in by listeners oftentimes. 248-539-9797. If you want to get one over, text it over now. And a lot of times they have nothing to do with sports. Most of the time. Yeah, Kang's got the questions behind the glass. Let's go. All right, I'm reaching into the pretzel tub right now. Grabbing out a question. Um, What do we got? All right, guys. Oh, this one's signed from Gonzo. Oh, here we go. All right, Gonzo. Hope you're listening. Sign your question. Yeah. <laughs> What's one thing at home that you have that would bring that you would bring to the antique road show? Is there something you have at your home that you would bring to the yeah. antique road show? Oh, do you, yeah. Do you, people, do you guys know what the oh, antique road show yeah, is? Yeah, yeah. I do not. Explain, yeah. Gator. So it's it's uh, the antique road show is is a television show where they evaluate. Uh, items that you have in the house. Oh yeah, I have this painting. It's been sitting in my attic for it's it's passed on from generation to generation. Just curious what it's worth. Well, it's an uh, it's an original Van Gogh. I hope you prepared for this. <laughs> no, but it's something that you have that you're yeah. not sure what the value is. That's uh-huh. what Antiques Roadshow is. They go to places and people bring their items there to get them evaluated. Okay. My grandfather. Uh oh. Is this? Did he go to war, and did he keep this somewhere? Uh, he is, is it a stopwatch? My grandparents. I don't know if it was my grandparents or my great grandparents. Came over from Old Ireland, watch. the O'Briens, <laughs> and when both my grandparents cool. passed away, there was what did they own that the grandkids wanted? And I took an old, old, old like eighteen hundreds or nineteen early nineteen hundreds radio. It's like made out of wood. And you can barely read the numbers anymore inside and it, like a twist of the dial. Look at that. Nice. So that could be worth some coin. But I, I, I 
when the when the draft of the grandkids came up, I went after the radio. Okay. For me, it's, on brand, huh? It is. Yep. Well, uh, for me, it's a an autographed baseball that I have that my father gave to me that he had won um, many years ago. It was it's from the mid seventies. It's got all. It's a, an actual authentic signed uh, baseball from the uh, Big Red Machine teams that won the World Series. So it's got Wait, every the 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 whole team. Yeah. So it's got Johnny Bench and how do you win this? And it was through work somehow, or um, I believe he. Won if it. you hit the Mega Millions, would you buy? <laughs> I mean, seriously, so how this, much, Kang? You're the collector guy. Well, you have to get it authenticated first. It, is it authenticated? I mean, it, it so has you don't been, know. I, you would take it to the antique road show and hopefully yeah, they can authenticate yeah, it for ex- you. Absolutely, right? I'm sure it's. Uh, I'm sure it's real. Um, and there's probably. Four Hall of Famers on that baseball, I think. Something wow. Like that. I think that's worth quite a bit of money. It might be. might be uh, worth, uh, I would think it's worth in the four digits, maybe four digits, maybe four, maybe a thousand. I don't know what it's worth, but uh, that's something I'd want to get evaluated. That's cool. I wish I had something like super old vase that, you know what I mean? That's what you want to bring to these antique road shows, a, a fine like old clock, um, whatever. Yeah, I, I don't think. a yard sale years yeah. ago. You know this is from... Uh, 1854. It's from the Ming Dynasty. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, but I don't have anything, unfortunately. I can't contribute to this. That's okay. Just you guys. Maybe an old PlayStation 1. <laughs> All right, next up. All right, next question. Two buttons in front of you guys. Oh, God. Button one, instant $1 million tax free. Button two, 50 50 chance, $50 million tax free. Which button are you pushing? <laughs> That was a good one. Fifty million tax free, fifty fifty, or an instant one million. <laughs> one million doesn't go as far as you might think. Too by the way, it's still a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I think I know where Doug's going. I'm curious where Gator's gonna go. So button one's the million, yeah. and button two's the fifty fifty at fifty million. Yeah. First of all, I hate this question. It's a fantastic question. But I know what I would do. Do you know what you would do? Yes. Okay. Kang, do you know what you would do? I think so. <laughs> All right. So we're going to do three, two, one, and then say it. Recapping. Button one is $1 million. Uh-huh. Instant tax-free. Button two is $50 million, but a 50-50 chance. $50 Ooh. million or nothing. Which, do you, which button do you hit? All right. Button one's the automatic million. Button two's 50 50 chance of 50 million. I'm going to go three, two, one, and then we'll say it. All right. All, all right. right. You ready? Three, two, one. Button two. one. So you both went two and I went one. Yeah. Yeah. That's about right because we play a lot or you don't. Yep. It, it, there's nothing. There's not like a real. Hey, buddy, wrong... one of us is going to get it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I'll be happy for you. More happy for me, though. We, we might as well. You, two, you guys are going to do it and then split it. <laughs> sure. Sounds okay. Good. Doug's take, over there with one million. You, you okay right. with guaranteed twenty five? Yeah. Yeah. Call heads or tails, Gator. Heads. And it's a head. All right. Here he goes, fifty mil. Hey, what about me? I'm you got nothing. Picture, I'm putting your kids to college. <laughs> you got nothing, right? All right. Look, I'll, I'll give you something, buddy. Thank you. I'll take care. That million, though, you obviously could invest and make it more. You want to do it? Yeah, we'll do it for you, Kang. You ready? Right. Ready. Oh, hold on. I messed up the app. Remember? Now I've got a commercial and an ad I can't. Oh, never mind. Yeah, <laughs> completely ruined it. <laughs> I'm thinking of a head or a tail. <laughs> all right, one more. Um, all right, heads or tails? Tails. And what do we got? I can't see from here. It's tails. a tail. You both yeah! <laughs> Good job. Good choice, Gator. Enjoy your $1 million. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Seriously. Boring. Yeah, down payment of the rest of the kids' college paid for and, and a good insurance plan. Uh, <laughs> last question. All right, here we go. Last question. Stupid what, question, too. <laughs> what's the largest animal you think you could beat up in a fight? <sighs> the largest animal. That you could beat up in a fight, hand to hand count combat. So I'm trying to think of the biggest animal that is not ferocious right? enough to take that's, me out. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's a smart way to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, don't go like bear or something like. Don't that. Don't do that. Yeah, there's probably an obvious answer out there. 
of a large animal because I I know I think I know what I'm going to say. Am I armed with a coconut or anything, or what am I armed with? Oh, it's oh, hand to hand. He said hand to hand combat. combat. I, I think I know what I'm going to say, and I have no idea. I've never seen one of these attack. I'm going to go giraffe. What? Like a baby giraffe? No, a giraffe. You could not beat up a giraffe. First of all, they're not carnivores. Oh, that's why he likes them. Second, <laughs> if I, I don't want to beat up yeah, a. Yeah, you wouldn't want to beat yeah. up one of your own. So he's not going to try to. He's not trying to try to eat me. How, what are you going to do? Punch it in the mouth? I don't know. Kick yeah, it, right. <laughs> kick it down there. It's like Ten feet tall. Oh. What you, kick it down there. Okay, what's your answer? Not giraffe. <laughs> that's my answer. I, I'm, I'm, I would say it's funny. You said giraffe. I'm like, how would you take out a giraffe? Do you try to put a, or, you know, a chokehold on <laughs> a giraffe? Kick it in the knees. Just laugh at you. Kick it the knees. Take um, out the knees first. Get them down to your level. Way all the way out of space. That's a great question. I'm not. Even, I don't know. Okay. I, I, I'm. Str- I'm really struggling with this. I'm going through all these animals in my <laughs> right. mind, and they're all like, they're all know, gonna kick your ass, <laughs> right? I mean, at some point, they can't be too big. No, you can't. And then, like, how small are we talking? <laughs> You know, a dog's a dog can kill you. You know? Oh yeah. Coyote will kill you. Mm-hmm. If if you really piss it off. Wolf will kill you, obviously. I there's gotta I'm, be some massive I'm thinking, I'm thinking docile of... animal out there. <laughs> Why you, don't go big then, All Doug? Right. Sloth. I'm gonna I could kill a sloth. Those things are just incredibly slow. Like yeah. there's no I sneak up behind it, yeah. Kick in the back of the head. Yeah. Getting in a rear naked choke. A few times. Well, I gotta watch out for those claws. They are those are dangerous, but I think you can maneuver around them because they just don't, they're a little too slow. I'll go sloth. Okay. Kang, you got a better answer than sloth or uh, giraffe? Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's better. I'm going to go with someone, you guys know this. I'm going with someone in the bird family because yeah. I can't stand you hate them. birds. Mm-hmm. Maybe. This is just out of spite. Yeah, it is. This is a real fight. This <laughs> is this is like. This, this has got personal. Kang is like sparrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to kill me some sparrows. Pigeons. Um, maybe. You Not baby it, pigeons because we you never see them, right? No. Could I take out a, like a flamingo? You think? You could take I think out so. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah so. you got. I go like flamingo. Right. Yeah. This would be a great question for Jansen. Jansen would be like bear. No. No. It'd be like uh, T Rex. <laughs> Jansen's like I got a plan. I got a plan for a giraffe. Let <laughs> <laughs> me see it coming. He'd be like Jared DeVries. Uh, all right, there it is. Thanks for your questions. If you want to get some questions in, two four eight five three nine ninety seven ninety seven. Fifty million, Kang. Nice job. Yeah, congratulations. I'm pretty happy with my million, but I feel yeah. like I missed out on the fun, the real fun. Your party's going to be way bigger than mine. It's true. It's Carson Anderson, 97 won the ticket.
I hope we get some feedback. Oh, we got feedback. <laughs> I've been told the YouTube giraffes fighting. And uh <laughs> we'll just get you to say what well, I take it back. Probably. Look, I, I I thought the answer was sketchy to begin with, but I'm not sure. I said the biggest animal, but I'm not sure that. <laughs> you could not take out a giraffe. I'm looking at these two giraffes go at it. You know how they fight? <laughs> <laughs> is it a, is it a jujitsu or is it a tr- traditional Thai boxing? What is Dude, it, Doug? <laughs> they lead with the head. Like they swing their heads at each other. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to. You're not right. surviving, Doug. Dude, I you know how he said sloth? I Googled this. So how big is a sloth? Because Jimmy came in, he's like laughing. He goes, yeah, how small they are. I'm like, oh, they're, they're like big enough to sit in the chair there. They're two and a half feet, and they weigh between nine and 17 pounds. <laughs> I didn't exactly go big. Well, the thing about the giraffes, too, is the entire time, they're sitting there looking elegant as hell while they're swinging their heads at each other. Beautiful creature. Here's the feedback. Uh, everyone, and you, and you want to kill one. No, they would kill him, Gator. Dude, don't worry about he that. He says he wanted to. I didn't say I wanted to. The question was, if you had to fight, what's the largest animal you could beat in a hand-to-hand combat? I said giraffe. I might be wrong. How, did you think about snake? No, but a lot of people <laughs> made that joke. A lot of people made the joke that Doug can beat the snake. Well, you Doug beat can't the snake. beat the snake. Yeah. You beat the snake in the past. Yeah. So wait, that whole forget, question, Doug. hold on. That question, let's circle back to what that came from. <laughs> that question. They don't forget. No, we forget. No, people do not forget. Because this is like four or five years ago <laughs> where we had found a video of a snake in a like at a beach. These people in the water and snakes slithering along and we're like it's like in the caribbean or somewhere we're like okay what would you rather have attack you would you rather it be a snake or a shark and then doug said he could beat the snake (laughs) and then gator said i'm sure you can can." (laughs) and then tex ensued for days if not weeks if not months and here we are years later doug's been beating the snake the first text the first text that came in is everyone knows Doug can beat the snake. Well, you didn't. Right. You're going bigger than the snake. Wait, he's going to try to go bigger than the snake. All right, here we go. A giraffe would kick Doug's ass. That's from True. LO. Next one. You can't beat up a giraffe, you idiot. <laughs> 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 Who do you think you are? <laughs> Did anybody come up with an animal that they think that, like, a decent-sized animal? No, they're they busy making they can... fun of Doug. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here for that. I, I do. Look, I'll read all these, and yes, there's plenty of them taking their shots at me. Come up with a better answer. Because I started thinking about it during the commercial break. I'm like, I don't think I could beat up a horse. And isn't that basically what a giraffe is, is a monster horse with a huge neck? <laughs> Uh, Jason says you get absolutely pummeled by a giraffe. Those things get attacked by lions and send them and fend them off by kicking them. This is the worst decision ever. <laughs> well, Jason, cut it out. Get out of here. A Bring giraffe would kill Doug in literal seconds. <laughs> <laughs> what on earth is he uh, Doug, I want you to go to the Detroit Zoo and find an expert over there. <laughs> and be like, do you think I can beat up a giraffe? <laughs> We have a zoologist in line yes. three. I seriously, I have a feeling. Like Doug's training and like I, Tyson. I'm never He's hitting gonna, mitts, getting ready to take out a giraffe. When they ask you, when did your career start to go downhill? It's going to be the giraffe question. Uh, Doug, please look the a video of two giraffes fighting. You've got no chance. Giraffes regularly fight off prides of lions. The fact that Doug thinks he can take down a full adult giraffe is literally hilarious. <laughs> Stick to the snake, Doug. <laughs> Stick to being the snake. All right, I'm going domestic house cat. <laughs> I'll just stop there. Quick YouTube giraffe fights. A giraffe would so punt cars through the field. <laughs> Rich says Doug would be dead immediately. <laughs> Doug! <laughs> Giraffe! Oh, now I gotta fight one. 
Yeah, right. Yeah, that's what you got to do. That's what Doug's got to do. Next time you go to the zoo, take a picture in front of the giraffes and, <laughs> and just, you know, taunt it a little bit. I, I got let this. It, let it know how lucky it is in its, it's, yeah. its enclosure. Uh, has anybody come up with a good answer to the question? Uh, some people are saying cow. Do you think they could take out a cow? Cows are huge. Yeah, cows yeah. are massive. Big, man. Um, this one I can visualize Doug <laughs> holding onto a draft's leg for dear luck. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh man! A pan- Someone says a panda. No way. Jimmy suggested a panda, and I'm like, you know how big pandas no, are. Those, been, they're strong. Said, got, hold on, he got panda confused with koala because well, koalas. But he, I but said, he said panda. Yeah, but I said koalas are the ones that are always hiding. He goes, oh yeah, them I guess. <laughs> Did Doug mean the giraffe from Toys R Us? <laughs> Yeah, what if somebody on Twitch said Doug's been banned from Toys R Us all over the United States? I think Toys R Us is banned from Toys R Us. Someone said I'm going to miss Doug. <laughs> <laughs> was that old Comcast commercial that had the baby giraffe? Uh, There's the Russian guy holding on to the giraffe. <laughs> fighting a giraffe is like fighting Ben Wallace standing on top of Ben Wallace. <laughs> Uh, a giraffe, he says. Like giraffe. <laughs> I don't say. <laughs> did you time? miss the rest of the question when I said, "What's the tallest animal?" <laughs> like you know, the more I think about this, though, there's not a lot of great answers to this question. There really aren't. That's why, why I, think, that's why I wonder are people come up with the answers. Yeah. But I'm just curious what your plan of attack was, like for the giraffe. Yeah. How are you? How are you yeah, going how... to fight the giraffe? I was going to kick it what? in in, in the legs. Ankle? Yeah, in the legs. Giraffes have kind of like thinner legs. Did and you not I, think the giraffe well, would get back? I was like, that was my plan, was I'd kick a giraffe in one of its thin legs. Yeah, leg kick, Gator. But, but, then I I did Google search. Watch the giraffe giraffe's the fight. Leg. I did Google search giraffe's fight, and I'm like, yeah, that leg doesn't look so thin from here. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> giraffes have a good sprawl. <laughs> if you do Google search or YouTube giraffe's fighting, they really got to work on something better. If you're a giraffe and you're trying to fight, swinging your head at something doesn't look great. But anyway, I mean, what animal would be like? They would be the heaviest or biggest? Could you actually? I mean, that's that's a great. It's an interesting question. It's not a great question. It's an interesting question. Yep. They're all great questions. And I, I started to think like like it would have like a big fish. What do you have to be in water then? Well, that's a thing. You're like, dead. How do you do it? You can't. I mean, I don't know if a, if a tuna fish is going to attack you. <laughs> I like. But you just start one. ripping at the gills, and you know. I like this one. I want this on the Tyson Paul undercard. <laughs> Doug versus giraffe. Now I get. I'll, I'll get that. Yeah. yeah. And Doug's limp body would be tossed around like a sock doll. <laughs> I'm gonna miss Doug. <laughs> If you don't have Netflix now. Uh, all right. Huge game tonight. Huge game. We will get to that today at 147. It's Carson Anderson, 97 won the ticket. Hey, looking for that perfect fish dish for Lent? Look no further than Twin Peaks. Every Friday during Lent, the fish? Twin Peaks is offering up their hand breaded and fried to order fish and chips with a 22 ounce Miller or Coors Light draft for 14 bucks. That's not all, though. They added lobster to the menu. The awesome chefs at Twin Peaks have created a new lobster roll BLT. You take out a lobster? <laughs> a lobster mac and cheese and a new twist on your favorite trout. Go ahead. Can you take out a trout? <laughs> <laughs> we have a monster weekend ahead of us, so make sure you take advantage of all the action at Twin Peaks. We all know St. Patrick's Day coming up, but also Selection Sunday, so the conference tournament action all weekend long. As the field of 68 is filled in. The best part, Twin Peaks girls are there. And their finest green lingerie to celebrate the Irish along with you. And their great deals on Irish car bombs for 6 bucks, $5 Jameson. To find a location nearest you, go to TwinPeaksRestaurant.com. Twin Peaks eats drinks and scenic views.